We are now on the record. Uh, this begins DVD number one in the deposition of John Bruce Jessen in the matter of Salim versus James Elmer Mitchell and John, John Bruce Jessen in the United States District Court, Eastern District of Washington. Today is January 20th, 2017, and the time is 10.07 a.m. This deposition is being taken at 130 North 18th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at the request of Gibbons PC. The videographer is Benjamin Neat of Magna Legal Services, and the court reporter is Connie Kent of Magna Legal Services. Um, all counsel and parties present will be noted on the stenographic record. Will the court reporter please swear in the witness? Sir, would you raise your hand, please? You swear the testimony give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Good morning. I'm Andrew Warden from the U.S. Department of Justice, and I represent the United States government in this case. On behalf of the United States government, I have with me here today Joseph Sweeney, an attorney with the CIA Office of General Counsel, Cody Smith, an attorney with the CIA Office of General Counsel, Heather Walcott, an attorney with the CIA Office of General Counsel, Megan Beckman, a paralegal with the CIA Office of General Counsel, Antoinette Shiner, an information review officer with the CIA, and on behalf of the Department of Defense, Richard Hatch, an attorney with the DOD Office of General Counsel, and Thomas Ellis, a senior program analyst from the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency. The United States government is not a party to this case, but we are here today in order to represent the interests of the United States. We understand the questions in this deposition will cover topics related to Dr. Jessen's career with the Department of Defense and later as a contractor with the CIA. Given the sensitive nature of the positions that Dr. Jessen held with these agencies and the information he acquired with those positions, we are here today to protect against the unauthorized disclosure of classified, protected, or privileged government information. Prior to this deposition, the government has provided the parties, uh, plaintiffs and defendants, with classification guidance from the CIA and the Department of Defense. I believe it's marked as Exhibits 1 and 2 for the record of uh, this year. Additional copies. Are these, um, Mr. Warden, the same documents that we marked as 1 and 2? The Dr. Mitchell stuff? Yes, they are. Okay. Madam Court Reporter, did you bring the exhibits? Maybe we could just get them out and save some time. Here's okay. some copies. Okay. Those are the originals? Okay. If anyone needs copies, right? So, Mark. Marked as Exhibit 1 is the classification guidance from the CIA. It's marked as U.S. Bates numbers 22 to 24, with the production date of May 20, 2016. It provides a list of categories of information about the CIA's former detention and interrogation program that remains classified, and a list of categories of information about the program that is now unclassified. Exhibit 2 is the Department of Defense guidance. It's marked as U.S. Bates number 2169, 2170 with the production date of January 14, 2017. It provides a list of categories of information about DOD's survival, evasion, resistance, and escape program that remains classified, and a list of categories of information about that program that is now unclassified. Uh, at the outset, we would issue an instruction to the witness, Dr. Jensen, that in response to any question, the government instructs the witness not to answer by reference to any of the information identified as classified and the guidance that we have provided. And we would reserve our right to object to any questions posed to Dr. Jessen and consistent with his non-disclosure agreements with the government, instruct Dr. Jessen not to answer any questions that would tend to call for the disclosure of classified, protected, or privileged government information. Anything else, Mr. Ward? That is all. So just so we're clear, we're following the same rules and agreements that we reached uh, prior to the commencement of Dr. Mitchell's deposition. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, good morning, Dr. Jessen. My name is Dror Ledeen, and I'm an attorney with the ACLU. Here with me are my colleagues, Larry Lusberg, Kate Chenikowitz, Hannah Shamsi, Stephen Watt, Avi Fry, and Dan McGrady. Um, we represent plaintiffs in the matter of Salim V. Mitchell. 
Civil Action Number 15-286 in the Eastern District of Washington, in which you are a named defendant. You are represented by counsel today, and I'm sure you've been prepared, but just so we're clear, I'll go through some instructions as to how the deposition is going to work. Um, as you see, we have a stenographer, and she's going to tra transcribe everything that's said today. We also have a videographer who will be recording your testimony. This case goes to trial in the future. Your testimony could be introduced through the transcript or video. Do you understand that? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to be asking the questions today, and you'll be providing responses. Your responses are under oath, and you should treat it just as if you were testifying in court. It's the same oath that would apply, even though we're in a less formal setting. Do you understand that? Yes. Your attorney, Mr. Smith, will be defending you. And if he has any objections, he will state those. Um, and if he does, please wait until his objection is finished before you respond. Do you understand that? Yes. Uh, also, please wait until I'm finished asking questions before you respond. I'll extend the same courtesy to you. It's important that we not speak over one another. If you don't understand a question or any part of a question, please ask me to rephrase it, and I'll be glad to do so. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I will ask you to verbalize your answers uh, because nods or gestures won't show up on the transcript. Um, are you on any drugs or medications today that would impair your ability to answer questions truthfully and accurately today? No. And uh, you can take a break at any time. Just let me know if you need to do so. Uh, I will ask that if there's a question pending, you answer that question before we take a break. Um, but otherwise, please feel free to just let me know if you need a break for any reason. If, a, if you answer a question, I will assume that you understood it and gave a truthful response. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Have you ever been deposed before? Once. What was the general nature of that action? I was deposed in relation to a homicide that took place in a military hospital. And um, just, uh, just returning to this deposition, did you discuss your testimony here today with anyone besides your attorneys? No. Thank you. Um, so I understand you, um, you have a PhD from Utah State, is that correct? Yes. What is that PhD in? Applied clinical psychology. And did you focus on anything in the course of your PhD? Applied clinical psychology. Uh, what, what does that mean? It's a accredited PhD program that allows you to sit for licensure as a clinical psychologist. Is there any distinction between applied clinical psychology and other forms of clinical psychology? No. <clears throat> In the course of that PhD, did you have any coursework on trauma? What specifically do you mean by trauma? Um, well, do you understand uh, the word trauma to mean something in the context of psychology? Yes. What do you understand it to mean? I believe there are multiple ways you can experience trauma. I just don't know what you're talking about. Um, well, I, have you ever studied the way people respond to, for example, a traumatic experience? Yes. Did you study that in the course of your PhD? Yes. Um, did you ever study post-traumatic stress disorder? I have studied it, or I've familiarized myself with it, but I don't, I'm not certain. But I don't believe that term even existed when I was in school. I see. I think it was called battle fatigue or something else. I see. And, and did you study battle fatigue when you were in school? Yeah. 
Um, what about uh, studies on getting information from people? Were those covered in your PhD program? Yes. Do you remember what you studied about that? As a clinician, you have to talk to people. So you're taught appropriate dialogue. Does that include hostile people? Could. What about ethics? Was that covered in your coursework? Yes. Did you have, was it compulsory to take a course on ethics? I th it probably was. Were those the ethics put out by the American Psychological Association or some other kind of ethics? I don't remember specifically. After you were done with your PhD, did you have to do any sort of continuing education on ethics? Yes. What, what sort of form did that take? Well, I, periodically you have to have so many credit hours of continuing education. I don't remember the specifics. Did you complete the ones that were required for licensure? Yes. Do you remember just sort of ballpark about how often you'd have to take a refresher course? No. Did you um, have to write a dissertation for your PhD? Yes. Do you remember the topic of it? Yes. What was that? This may not be precise. It's been a long time. Sure. It was a study on the effect of human or family sculpting on family dynamics. What does family sculpting mean? It's a therapeutic modality developed by a Dr. Caslin where to help a family examine difficulties, you have them act out roles regarding specific dynamics that they're struggling with. Did that involve um, doing any kind of research when you, when you wrote that dissertation? Yeah, you have to review literature and be familiar with what's been done. And so, yeah. What about any kind of experimentation? It's not, when you do a dissertation, uh, well, I don't, I don't know if you'd classify it experimentation. You do research, you, you have a, uh, a uh, hypothesis that you posit, and then you see if uh, what you do affects it in, or not. And beyond sort of a literature review, is there, is there any other kind of research involved uh, in that dissertation you wrote? No. Okay. Um, so after that, uh, after graduating with your PhD, do you do an internship? Do what? Sorry, an internship? Yes. Where was that? My hearing is not good, so you'll need to speak up. I'll, I'll do so. Thanks Thank for letting me know. Okay. I did an internship at Wilford Hall Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. And what kind of cases did you see there? The typical clinical psychology cases. So folks struggling with various kinds of mental you illness? You see inpatient, outpatient, uh, military, and dependent. Any of those folks have battle fatigue? I don't recall seeing anyone with battle fatigue while I was doing my residency or my internship. And then um, after your internship, <coughs> where did you go next? Hmm. I went to California, to Mather Air Force Base. How long were you there for? Three or four years. And was it another sort of treating clinical psychologist role? Mm -hmm. And um, do you remember if during that time you saw any folks with battle fatigue? I 
I don't remember. Was there, um, was there a point where that diagnosis, if you would have seen it, would shift over to um, post-traumatic stress disorder? Obviously, the name changed. I don't know when. And you, you became aware of that at some point? Yes. Um, did you receive any kind of training in diagnosing that condition? I don't recall going to a specific course, but the diagnosis in the, is in the uh, DSM manual, and uh, so I was familiar with what the... Um, and as a military psychologist, it's conceivable that you would be called upon at some point to treat someone with that condition? It is conceivable. Did you, in fact, ever treat someone who you diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder? Very briefly. Do you remember roughly when that was? Yes, I do, but I probably will need to consult with the Department of Defense. So I, I'm not going to ask you to get into any specifics about it, but you should definitely consult whenever you're, you're concerned. Um, well, in order to I think you've answered the question that's pending. Let's wait for the next question. Okay. Yeah, so, so just to clarify, um, if you think a question does call for classified information, please feel free to, to stop the question, um, or stop your answer, rather. That's what I was attempting yeah. to do. Yes. Is there another way you want me to do that? You want me to just say, stop, I think this is classified? Uh, no, that's, that's good. Um, and also saying you know, that you need to consult with the Department of Defense is just fine. Um, okay. So I'm not going to ask you any, any specifics about that person um, who you briefly treated. Uh, just generally speaking, um, do you remember, uh, you know what, scratch that. Um, so after you were, um, I believe we were, you were telling me that uh, afterwards you went to, the, um, to be a clinical psychologist, uh, was that at, a after your internship? Was that at the uh, U.S. Air Force Hospital at uh, Mother Air Force Base? No. Oh, at the U.S. Air Force Hospital. Yes, yes. it was. Yeah. And then what was your next job? Uh, I went to San Vito Air Station, Italy. And what was your role there? Would it be helpful if you put his resume in front of him? Maybe we can move this along. Um, uh, sure. Yeah, I don't mind if, if that would be helpful for you. Would, would you like your resume, sir? It's all written down there. All right. Um, well, uh, would you like to mark uh, the next exhibit? What are we up to? 26? 26. All right, so you were, um, looks like you were the uh, chief of mental health at uh, San Vito Air Station, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And what, what did you do in that role, it, to the extent that it, that it is not classified? I did clinical psychology for active duty and dependent personnel. Ms. Lyndon, just so the record's clear, we've placed before the witness what's been marked as exhibit number 26. It bears U.S. Bates labels, last four digits, 1901 through 1905. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, and did you supervise other psychologists in that role? No. So what does it mean to be the chief of mental health? Depends where you're at. Uh, what did it mean at San Vito Air Station? It meant I was the only mental health provider at the air station. I see. Um, 
and it looks like um, like after that you went to uh, you went to the U.S. Air Force Survival School. Yes. Right? And uh, and what did you do there? I was in charge of. monitoring the instructors and the students as they went through training. And were you still treating patients at that time as well? I would see instructors and their families if they had work-related or generic clinical-related problems. And I would see students if they had acute problems when they were going through the course. And was that um, just for diagnosis purposes? It was, it was a little more like, with students, a little more like triage. You, you uh, intervene, and if they need follow-on care, you send them back to their base or refer them somewhere else. Um, and for the more long-term folks, it, was it more like treatment? I saw some instructors and some family members of instructors for longer treatment. When you were... Uh, your, your role was described as chief psychological services? That's correct. And did that mean that you supervised um, other people? Yes. What, what sort of, um, what were the roles of the people you su supervised? I supervised, I believe, three psychological technicians. What, what's a psychological technician? It's a para-professional trained by the military to assist in psychological care. Does that mean they would um, ask questions of, of people who, you know, were experiencing some kind of distress? Some, sometimes. Would they aid in the treatment too? Sometimes. All right. Um, and at the same time, you were also supervising uh, the instructors at the combat school? Monitoring would be a more accurate term. What, what sort of things would you monitor them for? Make sure that their comportment was consistent with the operating instructions for the programs they were in. What, is, what does that mean? There are two basic divisions of training at a survival school. There's field training, which consists of helping people take care of themselves if they're isolated, building shelters, mm -hmm. nourishing themselves, also protecting themselves from the enemy if they're in a combat area and rendering assistance to others if needed. The other part is the resistance training laboratory. And DOD, I'll do my best to stay where I need to be, but stop me if I go somewhere I shouldn't, please. So some of our military uh, at times are captured either by a lawful enemy or detained by a government or held by terrorists. And the resistance training laboratory is designed to help them acquire skills so that if they're in that position, they can protect the United States government and themselves. And um, if you can answer, do you run different scenarios for different types of captors? There, there are different scenarios. There are different courses. There are different threats that are addressed in different courses. Uh, in the more advanced courses, uh, particularly related to 
counterterrorism. Uh, we had to prepare scenarios that were consistent and accurate with the various terrorist groups, their modus operandi, how they would treat captives, what their weaknesses were, what their beliefs were, what their vulnerabilities were. Condense that into a package uh, so that if one of these high risk operators were captured, uh, sometimes they're specific to a mission. If they're going to a particular place and there's a particular terrorist group and the risk of capture is high, then you tailor it in that way. And that, uh, those are fewer in number but higher in risk of capture. The general uh, school is for, in the Air Force anyway, is for anyone on flying status uh, and anyone who would be stationed in a high risk of capture zone. Uh, they receive scenario training also, but it's more generic uh, and it is more consistent with uh, the code of conduct. Uh, so it's not as specific. Uh, but it's designed to prepare them for a different environment. And um, you said <coughs> that you would monitor the, the comportment of the people who were instructing these scenarios. Do I have that right? Um, yes. And what would be sort of uh, an improper comportment for an individual monitoring a scenario? Sorry, excuse me, let me rephrase that. What would be an improper comportment for an individual uh, was training in that scenario. There is a phenomenon that uh, those of us who work in this area identify as abusive drift. And uh, without proper oversight and independent eyes on uh, authorities, people can start to push the limits of what they're authorized to do. And uh, part of my role was to make sure uh, that I identified that and stopped it and let it happen. And that, that would happen even in training? It does happen sometimes in training. Or the emergence of it is evident. Do you think it um, happens more in training or in real world type scenarios? I think it happens more in real world. And uh, in the course of your monitoring of these scenarios, these training scenarios, did you ever have to stop uh, a trainer from doing something that he or she was doing? Rarely. But it happens sometimes? Yes. So you monitored uh, these scenarios for about four years as the chief of psychological services? Is that I, correct? I think that's correct. And then um, how did your role change when you became uh, deputy director? I went into a different uh, classified program. Um, and so it says here, uh, Deputy Director, Code of Conduct, SEER Training, Directorate, Joint Personnel Recovery Agency. Um, without saying anything that's classified, it, it looks like at least um, the name of, of this agency, the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency, uh, and of the Code of Conduct, SEER Training, Directorate, are unclassified. Um, is there anything? you can say about your role there? Yes. Could you tell me uh, in unclassified terms what that role entailed? Yes. What, what did that role entail? It evolved over time. Uh, the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency didn't exist when I started. It was called Operation 
operating location Fairchild. Continued to do the same basic mission, but became absorbed as the bureaucracy grew and the commands changed. So my role was similar to what I had done at the basic school, but in addition, uh, I became responsible for seer psychology in the Department of Defense because there are other services teaching other courses, same basic standard but uh, different services and other psychologists that work there. And did you supervise the psychologists in the other programs in some way? Supervise probably isn't the accurate word. How would you describe it? I consulted with them and I worked for the office who had ultimate authority over the training they were conducting. Did you play any role in um, deciding the guidelines for what techniques could and could not be used in the different branches SEER training? Not really. Were you aware that there were different guidelines in the different schools? Yes. Did the, um, did the Navy SEER school, um, for example, allow use of the waterboard uh, to the best of your knowledge? One of them did. Was the waterboard permitted in the Air Force School? No. It wasn't used. I don't know if they ever made some kind of decision to not allow it, but it wasn't used. And was the, um, was the Code of Conduct SEER Training Directorate the entity that would make those types of decisions as to what was allowed? Yes. Ultimately, the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency would make that decision. Um, and I think, uh, I think it also says here um, that at the same time as you had that, that Joint Personnel Recovery Agency role, um, you were also the Senior Department of Defense um, SEER psychologist. Was there anything different in that role uh, than than the role you were you were you had in the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency? Not really. Um, were you still treating patients at all during this time? Infrequently. Do you have any kind of estimate on how often you'd treat a patient? Uh. I could only guess. All right, well, I'm not going to ask you to guess. Um, what, about, uh, what about just sort of that, that triage role for, for trainees? Did you do any of that during this time? Mm, yes. So if a trainee was experiencing some difficulty in the training, you might talk to them to see the nature of their problem? Yes. And if their problem seemed to have some level of seriousness, you might refer them to their bases treating uh, psychologist? Yes. Um, <coughs> did you ever see, during the course of those um, triages, uh, a trainee who was exhibiting signs of post-traumatic stress disorder? I think so. What did you do when you saw that sign of post-traumatic stress disorder? I intervened. Uh, what was the nature of that intervention? Pull them from training. S stabilize them. Consult with them. See if they can go back in training. And if they can't, then 
continue to work with them until you've handed them off to their home unit. Did you have to sometimes make the call that people just couldn't continue with training? I hadn't, I never made that call. Okay. <laughs> um, now, um, you were also uh, a professor uh, at times, is that correct? I taught college courses. Um, what kind of courses were those? Clinical psychology courses. Were those undergrads that you were teaching? Mostly. Um, do you recall if in those courses you ever taught about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? I didn't. What about um, teaching them about ethics? Once. When, when was that? I was asked by uh, the local CME provider to help with an ethics course that I was attending. Do you recall what the ethics course was teaching? No. Okay. Um, now, did you ever teach graduate students or were they just undergraduates? No, I've taught graduate students. Did you ever supervise any kind of research conducted by a graduate student? No. Um, I'd like to uh, direct your attention um, to that second page of your, your resume uh, marked with U.S. Bates 1902. Uh, and if you look there, uh, there's a table of the um, special mission unit courses uh, that it says you, you researched, developed, and applied. Um, and the, the fourth from the bottom there on the right um, says legal aspects of captivity. Do you see that? Yes. Do you recall teaching that course? Yes. Do you remember uh, what you meant by legal aspects of captivity? This was a course to help these high risk of capture people understand some of the eccentricities of foreign government legal systems that might entrap them. So you, did you cover um, any kind of international law in that course? No. Uh, so when you, when you taught students about, or sorry, when you taught the, um, the special mission units about the legal aspects of captivity, did you cover the Geneva Convention? That's a different block of training. Did you ever train anyone on the Geneva Convention? We familiarize students with the Geneva Conventions. Um, when you say familiarized, sort of, what, what does that mean? We had a canned presentation from the Department of Defense that we were instructed to give to the students. And, uh, and did you, in fact, give it to the students? Yes. All right. Um, have you ever debri debriefed, uh, released American prisoners of war? Yes. Had any of them, <coughs> excuse me, been subject to coercion? Yes. Um, any of them been subject to physical coercion? A few. And did you interview them when they returned? Did I interview them? When they returned to the United States? Yes. Did you assess them for 
whether they had uh, suffered any kind of long-term effects from their treatment? When repatriation, reintegration takes place, you have a team of specialists, include psychiatrists, physicians, psychologists, a plethora of people. So if I suspected that someone was suffering ill effects as a result of coercion, uh, I would definitely talk to them about it, but I would ultimately refer them to the person on the team who was there to take care of them. And, and were there, in fact, people um, who, in the course of their reintegration, uh, you assessed to be experiencing ill effects as a result of the coercion they experienced? Yes. Without you know, identifying any individual, <coughs> could you describe for me what, what that kind of ill effect uh, would be that you could see as a result of coercion? Yes. I could give you an example. Please do. A pilot, a robust, highly athletic, shot down, captured. held in a prison, makeshift prison. Uh, not fed adequately. Lost a significant amount of weight and muscle mass. Could become very preoccupied with that when his self-identity was highly invested in his physicality. So it could come to represent not just a physical degradation, but it could have attached to it a multitude of other uh, concerns or experiences associated with captivity. And did you um, did you see uh, cases in which people were sort of affected by their captivity in ways that changed their sense of self or challenged it in some way? The people I worked with were pretty robust group. Uh, I don't recall anyone who didn't bounce back uh, well from what happened. So even, even the people who initially experienced some kind of ill effects, um, they'd get better <coughs> with treatment? They would. They'd get better with treatment? Yes. Is it your understanding that, um, that they could basically be cured after some period of time? Yes. Do you have a sense of how much treatment would that, that might entail to cure someone of this kind of damage? It varies. Could it be years? It varies. Um, just, you know, I, I, I'm not a professional, so I'm, I'm just trying to, to get a sense here. Could it be as, as short as a few days? It varies. Okay. Um, and these, uh, 
these robust uh, pilots and others, um, had they been resistance trained in the United States before they had fallen into captivity? Some. Was there a noticeable difference in terms of the resilience of folks who had been trained and those who had not been resistance trained? On the whole, there is a difference. What would that difference be? If you have a plan, <coughs> almost regardless of its effectiveness, you have more of a sense of control and predictability, which helps you be more resilient. And if you lose control and predictability, would you be less resilient? Yes. Did you ever diagnose any of these uh, returned POWs? W with any? I don't understand. Sorry. Did you did you ever did you did you ever assess them? You know, in accordance with say the the DSM. Uh, to determine whether they had some condition? No. Was that a responsibility of someone else on the team? Yes. Um, were you aware of any diagnoses that were given to these returned POWs? I don't remember. I don't know if I ever knew. Ballpark, do you have a sense of how many returned POWs and captives um, you were involved in debriefing? Just a, I could only give you a guess. Uh, do you think it's more than 10? Yes. More than 20? I don't know. OK. Um, now, we were talking earlier about uh, supervising, or sorry, monitoring the, um, the resistance training. Uh, scenarios. In the context of monitoring those resistance training scenarios, did you ever observe uh, the use of physical techniques as a training measure? Yes. Um, are there an array of techniques that were used, for example, at the, uh, at the Air Force Base Fairchild? I'm not sure what you mean. I guess what I mean is, is there sort of a menu of techniques that, uh, that a trainer would use um, in order to train the people going through the SEER program? I wouldn't call it a menu. W what should I call it? A I think list, like you said, okay. is accurate. Um, so was this list of techniques kept somewhere, or was it more of an informal thing? This list is, uh, has its origin and the authority to use it in the Department of Defense through the, I think now the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency. And uh, they're the only ones that can authorize the SEER schools to use the techniques. And do you know what these, sorry. Do you know how, uh, how these techniques were initially selected or proposed? I have a general understanding. What, what would that be? My understanding is that at the conclusion of World War I, it became evident that our country wasn't doing an adequate job in preparing service members for captivity. It was at that time that the code of conduct was prolongated and not long after that uh, various elements within the Department of Defense started to do training and over time they identified these techniques 
precisely how, by whom, and when, I don't know. When I came to work for the agency, they were already established, codified. But that's my recollection of their history. Did the, um, during the time you were at the agency, did the list of techniques change in some way? Hmm. I don't remember. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce another exhibit, uh, which is tab two. Sorry, just showing it. Oh, was this marked last time? I don't think it was. Oh, okay. Oh, here's, uh, here it is. Uh, so we've, uh, we've marked for the record um, document labeled Report of the Committee on Armed Services of the United States Senate Inquiry into the Treatment of Detainees in U.S. Custody. Uh, and that's marked as, what exhibit number is that? 27. Thank you. Um, have you ever seen this report? No. Um, do you remember giving testimony to the Committee on Armed Services? Yes. Do you remember roughly when that was? Years ago. Um, maybe around 2007, does that sound? I don't remember specifically. All right. Um, well, I'd like to, uh, to direct your attention um, to uh, the, no the page numbered um, XXVI. Page number what? XXVI. Uh, so that would be in the, in the introduction. Uh, there's, a, there's a list there of, of uh, what the Senate Armed Services Committee has labeled as its conclusions. I don't know where you're at. I can help you. Oh. Okay. Um, so if I could uh, direct your attention to conclusion number three. Uh, and just, just have you review that and let me know when you're ready. Um, so, you see there at the end it says, uh, the purpose of SEER resistance training is to increase the ability of U.S. personnel to resist abusive interrogations, and the techniques used were based in part on Chinese communist techniques using, used during the Korean War to elicit false confessions. Did you ever have an understanding that the uh, SEER techniques were based in part on Chinese communist techniques from the Korean War? I think I do remember that. Uh, do you think you knew that uh, when you were a SEER psychologist? When I was at the SEER school. When you were at the SEER school, yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you think you, you knew at the time that these techniques had been used by the Chinese communists to elicit false confessions? 
I don't remember false confessions. Did you have any sense of uh, whether these techniques could induce a person to make a false confession? I don't understand your question. Uh, so there's this list of techniques that's authorized for use uh, in, uh, by the Joint Personnel Recovery Agency right. uh, for use in training our soldiers to uh, resist certain kinds of interrogation. Um, and you had some awareness that these, some of these techniques were based in part on Korean War techniques used by the Chinese communists. What I want to know is whether you had any understanding at the time uh, that these techniques could induce an individual who was being subjected to them to make a false confession. Objection. You can answer the question. Hmm? You can answer. Yeah, I don't have a specific memory of concluding that these could be used for false confessions. Do you think there's a Do you think it was inaccurate of the Senate to say that they could be used for false confessions? Objection. You answer. Let me let, let me ask that in a better way. Your your, your lawyer is right, of course. Um, do you think? Uh, <laughs> um, so the sentence here is. Um, using those techniques for interrogating detainees was also inconsistent with the goal of collecting accurate intelligence information as the purpose of SEER resistance training is to increase the ability of U.S. personnel to resist abusive interrogations and the techniques used were based in part on Chinese communist techniques used during the Korean War to elicit false confessions. Do you agree with that sentence? Let me just state for the record my objection. The witness has testified that he hasn't seen this document before. You have a right to review the document um, in its entirety before you answer that question. Now, I'm not suggesting that you want to go through 200 and some pages, but uh, you have the right to do that. Well, I don't know who wrote it. Uh, it's obviously written with an agenda because it suggests that people were treated like animals. I think that you may be conflating what happened in the Department of Defense in Abu Ghraib with other things, or maybe you're trying to connect them. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure the direction of your question, and I don't, I don't know what's in here. Uh, I want to answer your question truthfully, but I don't want to be trapped. I, I, by, by some uh, scheme. Uh, so if I, you'll rephrase the question again, I'll try and answer it again honestly. Sure. I, you know, leaving aside any, any matters about Abu Ghraib or, or anything else, I'm, I'm really just curious about whether you agree or disagree uh, with the sentence here, uh, which, you know, I, I can paraphrase it, but I, I really would just prefer to have you um, let me know if, if this question, if the sentence is wrong, and if it's wrong, why it's wrong. So the, the sentence again is, um, the use of, it, it might be easier in fact, let's just take the whole conclusion. I apologize for, for starting with the second sentence. The use of techniques similar to those used in SEER assistance training. You know, uh, I don't think I can answer your question. I, I don't know what they were thinking when they wrote this. I don't know what their agenda was. I know they certainly had one when I talked to them. Uh, I don't know what you're getting at. Uh, I'm not trying to be obstructionistic, but I'm trying to be prudent. All right, let's, uh, let's leave this aside for the moment. Um, let, let, let me direct your attention to, uh, to a different page, which is uh, X111. X111. That's right. Okay. Um, so, uh, if you
you look at the third paragraph there, okay. it says, GIPRA is the DOD agency that oversees military survival, evasion, resistance, and escape training. Is that accurate? Yes. And then the next sentence says, during the resistance phase of SEER training, U.S. military personnel are exposed to physical and psychological pressures, and then it says those are SEER techniques, designed to simulate conditions to which they might be subject if taken prisoner by enemies that did not abide by the Geneva Conventions. Is that accurate? You should ask the Department of Defense expert over there. It's uh, his document, not mine. I, I mean, we, you know, we may do that, but right now uh, you're, you're the one under oath, so um, could you just let me know if that, if that is an accurate sentence? I think it is. Is there, is there some hesitation? Do you think there might be a reason why it's not accurate? I don't know. Okay. Um, so you don't know of a reason why that sentence would not be accurate? <laughs> you have me confused. I apologize. Um, let me, let, let's just go to that sentence again, and you can just tell me if there's anything there that's not accurate. During the resistance phase of SEER training, U.S. military personnel are exposed to physical and psychological pressures, SEER techniques, designed to simulate conditions to which they might be subject if taken prisoner by enemies that did not abide by the Geneva Conventions. I think that is accurate, but I'm not the DOD spokesman. All right. Uh, but you were, a, you were a SEER instructor, right? I was a... Uh, A SEER instructor is associated with a basic program, so I was an instructor, but it was with a special survival training program. Okay. And did that survival training program also um, simulate conditions uh, to which a person who was experiencing the program might be subject to if taken prisoner by enemies that did not abide by the Geneva Conventions? Yes. The, the next sentence says, as one GIPRA instructor explained, SEER training is based on illegal exploitation under the rules listed in the 1949 Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of prisoners over the last 50 years. Is that accurate? I don't know who determines what legal and illegal, but the techniques were uh, to represent what we thought our enemy might do if they weren't adhering to the Geneva Conventions. So the techniques were simulating violations of the Geneva Conventions? Possibly. <laughs> Um, now, the, the next paragraph in this document says, typically those who play the part of interrogators in SEER school neither are trained interrogators nor are they qualified to be. Do you agree with that sentence? Typically, typically that's accurate. Um, says these role players are not trained to obtain reliable intelligence information from detainees. Is that accurate? Typically, that's accurate. And it says their job is to train our personnel to resist providing reliable information to our enemies. Is that correct? Yes. As the Deputy Commander for the Joint Forces Command, JPRA's highest headquarters put it, quote, the expertise of JPRA lies in training personnel how to respond and resist interrogations not in how to conduct interrogations. Is that accurate? Yes. Thank you. So, um, prior to 9-11, did you ever discuss with anyone the possibility of using this list of SEER techniques uh, to actually interrogate prisoners? Objection. You can answer. 
Am I supposed to answer? Yes. Sorry. No, I did not. Okay. Do you remember the first time you discussed with someone the possibility of using SEER techniques uh, in a real life interrogation? I do. Was that person Dr. Mitchell that you discussed that with? He was one of them. Do you remember roughly the time frame which you had this first conversation? I do. When was that? June 2002. So prior to that time, you don't recall ever discussing the use of SEER techniques in a real world interrogation? No. Now, after 9-11, uh, I believe the CIA commissioned Dr. Mitchell to review a document that it has been described as the Manchester Manual. Do you know what I'm referring to? I do. Did you aid Mr. Mitchell in that review? I did. And um, do you recall how you became involved in reviewing the Manchester Manual? I do. How did that come to happen? I was contacted by first a person in the CIA and then by Dr. Mitchell and asked if I could ask for permission from the Department of Defense to come and help them. And that permission was granted? Yes. And so did you and Dr. Mitchell produce a paper uh, that was titled Recognizing and Developing Countermeasures to Al-Qaeda Resistance Training to Interrogation Techniques, a Resistance Training Perspective? Yes. And um, I, think, uh, I think that document was marked as Exhibit 9 at Dr. Mitchell's deposition, or a redacted version of that document. Do you have that, or would you like our copy? Did you need this? We'll take it just to move things along. Yeah, we have it. Thanks. Thank you. Now, um, do you do you recognize this document? I recognize the title. And if you, if you turn to page two of, of this document, uh, which is United States Bates 001149, uh, if you want to just look at the executive summary um, to refresh your recollection, I wanted to ask you a question about it. Now, I just want to ask about a sentence in there where 
I believe uh, you and Dr. Mitchell wrote, we are familiar with how hostile countries approach interrogation and knowledgeable about how trained captives organize their resistance efforts. And uh, I, what I wanted to ask you about was, how did you become familiar with how hostile countries approach interrogation? Could you repeat that? I sure. How did you become familiar with how hostile countries approach interrogation? So, Department of Defense, you'll have to help me here uh, because I don't want to step across the line. <clears throat> Do you want to take a minute to consult no, with them? No, I'm ready. Um, this pertains more particularly to special mission units than it does standard SEER training students. Uh, we, the, the uh, Joint Personnel Recovery Agency, trained uh, specific special mission units in what we would call their high risk of capture course, and additionally, conducted exercises, no-notice exercises, uh, often to prepare them for specific missions. In the course of this work, we had to review and be spun up on a lot of intel regarding the environment they were going into, the groups that might hold them captive, their techniques, procedures, their TTP. Sir, uh, what does TTP mean? Techniques, tactics, oh. and procedures. Thank you. Uh, so that if they were captured, they could take care of themselves. So as a result, uh, we were quite current on the various terrorist groups, uh, hostile governments, uh, and these scenarios would be constructed in a way that the operator would go into a training scenario that was realistic, it would be captured, and would be confronted by as realistic as possible uh, the enemy that they might face. In order to do that, you have to understand these things. Uh, and why would, um, why would familiarity with how hostile countries approach interrogation, why would that inform a paper on countermeasures for the United States to use against Al-Qaeda captives? You lost me. Sure. So you're providing here, if I'm understanding it correctly, a summary. Uh, and it says that it suggests methods for recognizing sophisticated resistance uh, to interrogation techniques are being used, uh, as well as it provides um, how to, uh, some kind of suggestion as to how to develop countermeasures to that resistance training. Correct. What I'm trying to understand is you're, you're explaining here, I believe, um, your qualifications to provide uh, that type of, of analysis, um, and you're including in here your combined 32 years of experience in providing operational support to detained U.S. personnel, um, training special operations personnel, as you were describing, um, debriefing hostages, as we talked about. Um, and then you say, we're familiar with how hostile countries approach interrogation. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand why the way hostile countries approach interrogation is relevant uh, to the developing of countermeasures for the United States to use. Objection. You may answer the question. Well, do you understand the history of this Manchester Manual? Um, I understand. Uh, I understand some of its history. I, you know, I, I don't need you to to get into its history. I don't think you can. I don't think I can answer your question without explaining to you what happened. Okay, I, I don't mean to cut you off. No, I didn't feel cut off. 
the witness needs a minute, we're happy to consult okay. with them on this. Sure. Why, why don't we do that? Vis -a -vis, at least vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the yeah, Manchester. Yeah, absolutely. Issue. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, so can we go off the record? The time is 11.22 a.m. We are now off the video record. The time is now 1.22 p.m. We are now back on the video record. I think uh, before we broke, um, you testified that no one likes to be the recipient of physical pressures, um, but that you've had all these things done to you multiple times, not by hostile governments, uh, but certainly in very realistic ways. In your mind, is there a difference between having these pressures done to you by a hostile government um, versus uh, in training? In terms of how they're uh, employed, no. In terms of where you're at emotionally, I think it is different. How, how so? I think you'd have more concern about the outcome. Like what, what kind of concern? I don't know. It depends on the person. That they might have more fear or more despair? I so we're done. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll just finish my question. If it were done by a hostile government? Perhaps. Um, sorry. Um, did you have an impression when you um, and Dr. Mitchell uh, put together these list of techniques, whether the CIA had already made a decision as to whether it was going to use physical coercion on Abu Zubaydah? I didn't know. Um, and did there come a time when you understood the CIA to have made a decision to use physical coercion on Abu Zubaydah? Yes. Do you remember roughly when that was? Roughly. When was that? About a month after I left the Langley. So were you at the site at the time that that decision was made? I was at a site at the time. And um, the proposal of the techniques was made at Langley? I don't understand your question. Sure. Um, when you and Dr. Mitchell uh, put together the list of techniques, were you at Langley? Yes. Um, if we can um, return to the, uh, I think it's Exhibit 27, the uh, Armed Services Committee report. <coughs> looking at uh, page 24. Now, I want to ask you about that paragraph that's right after the redacted block. Um, so it says here that, um, that you said the use of physically coercive <coughs> techniques may be appropriate uh, when, one, there is good reason to believe that the individual has perishable intelligence, 
Two, the techniques are lawful and authorized. Three, they are carefully controlled with medical and psychological oversight. Four, someone who is not otherwise involved in the interrogation can stop the use of the techniques. And five, the techniques do not cause long-term physical or psychological harm. Is that your view on um, today, on when the use of physically coercive techniques may be appropriate? Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, and it says here uh, that you acknowledge that empirically it is not possible to know the effect of a technique used on a detainee in the long term unless you study the effects in the long term. Is that accurate? Yes. At the time that, um, that you and Dr. Mitchell proposed the use of these techniques, um, did you know whether the long-term effects of the techniques had been studied? I knew that they'd been used for 40 years, monitored with each application, and that there was no long-term harm. And, and by used for 40 years, do you mean used on trainees? In, in the, the SEER school. Do you know if there were any studies on the effects of these techniques when used on people who weren't volunteers? No. Um, would that have made any difference to you if there were such studies? I have no way of knowing that. Um, could you... Um, You take a look at um, pages 30 to, to 31. And the, the question I'm asking is, is going to be just the paragraph that's at the very bottom of page 30 and continues on to 31. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to ask you about some of the, uh, the differences between SEER training uh, and actual detention that Dr. Agraseg identified. Uh, so first it says that um, the difference he identified was that the extensive physical and psychological pre-screening processes for SEER school students uh, are not feasible for detainees. Do you agree with that statement? That's Dr. Agraseg's statement, not my statement. Do you agree with his view? No. Do you think that um, <coughs> SEER school students receive extensive physical and psychological pre-screening? Receive what? Extensive physical and psychological pre-screening. Well, it's not extensive, but they receive it, yes. And do the people in the special mission units receive extensive physical and psychological pre-screening? Yes. Uh, and the ones in the special mission units would be the ones who receive uh, the more physically coercive pressures in their training? Yes. Um, would you agree that that extensive physical and psychological pre-screening that special mission unit operators receive 
is not feasible for detainees. No, I wouldn't. Uh, all the detainees were extensively screened, at least the ones I worked on. What was the nature of that screening? They had psychological evaluations and physical evaluations, and they had psychologists and physicians that were there 24-7 and watch what was going on. Um, the, the watch what was going on, that would happen after the interrogation began? No. It happened while it was occurring. Um. <coughs> Do you, um, turning to uh, the second difference that Dr. Agraseg identified, um, he says there was a variance in injuries between a SEER school student who enters training and a detainee who arrives at an interrogation facility after capture. Um, would you agree that that's a difference between SEER trainees and detainees? I don't know of any data on that. I don't know where Agraseg got his. Um, well, let me ask you, when you, when you were overseeing or um, monitoring or involved in some way in the SEER program, did you ever see a SEER trainee who was being subjected to interrogation pressures while they had an open wound? No, I don't think so. Did you ever um, see any kind of SEER trainee participate in a training um, when they had recently received a gunshot wound? I never saw a SEER student who had contributed to the death of 3,000 Americans and possibly had the knowledge of where physical nuclear material was that could destroy a city in the United States either. Understood. Um, would you agree that um, SEER training was voluntary? Yes. And that it could be terminated by the student at any time? Yes. Would you agree that when a detainee was in CIA custody, that was not voluntary and could not be terminated by the detainee at any time? No. You would not agree? I would not agree. Could you explain? A detainee could, deter could uh, stop interrogation any time. All they had to do was cooperate. And during each interrogation, there were medical, psychological, administrative, and intelligence staff, as well as guards, who were charged with a specific responsibility that if they felt anything was not authorized, or if there was a physical or psychological threat to the detainee, that they would, could, and would stop it. Um, do you think there were ever points <coughs> in which detainees were actually unable to stop an interrogation because they could not provide the, the answer to the question that would end their interrogation? Never in my presence. To the best of your knowledge, did that ever happen in the program? Objection. Uh, let, let me let me rephrase that. I have, I have no oh. knowledge. Excuse me. He's going to rephrase his question. Oh, okay. Yeah. To the best of your knowledge, did that ever happen in the context of the CIA's former detention and interrogation program? Objection. I have no knowledge of that. I do know that there were multiple efforts by the CIA to interrogate and gain intelligence that I was not involved in and knew nothing about until I started reading these documents. The effort that I was involved in was specifically for Abu Zubaydah only. And then 
they ask us to help with someone else, and then they ask us to help with someone else. But these other efforts that were going on at the same time in other places, I had no knowledge of at the time I was working with Zubeda. Excuse me for one second. Uh, I would ask the government, Mr. Warden, is the witness permitted to identify the specific detainees that the government asked him to work with? Supplement your answer, Doctor. As I said to you, uh, I was asked to go and work on Abu Zubaydah. Later, uh, we were asked to interrogate Nashiri, uh, KSM. While those efforts were taking place, I learned subsequently to uh, interrogate Abu Zubaydah that other efforts, other people, which predated my involvement, my and Jim's involvement, were already interrogating, questioning people at other locations. I had nothing to do with any of those efforts. Uh, except for one, which you'll undoubtedly talk to me about, Gul Rahman. Um, so I can tell you unequivocally that what you asked me did not happen when I was there and I was present and I was helping <coughs> interrogate someone. But I can't tell you what happened with all these desperate efforts that were going on uh, because they were compartments and uh, I didn't know. Okay. Just for the record, can you identify KSM so the record's oh. clear? Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's the mastermind of 9 11. Personally trained and nurtured all of them men who flew the jets into various locations, assisted in other, a lot of other operations, uh, arguably the most lethal uh, terrorist that we ever interrogated and that the U.S. holds. Um, thank you. Um, let's, um, Let's turn to the, uh, the document that was marked as Exhibit 18 in Dr. Mitchell's deposition. Actually, it's Pack 12 here. that already? I, I believe your lawyer has it. But well, I have my copy, oh, but I don't have the original copy. I, yeah. I apologize. I um, so you should just, uh, just take a moment to, or as long as you need to familiarize yourself with it. Okay.
big one? Yes. <coughs> Have you ever seen this cable before? I saw it just recently with my attorneys. Um, and you don't recall having seen it before then? You, no. You don't. Um, on the first page it says, um, while the techniques described in HQS meetings and below are administered to student volunteers in the U.S. in a harmless way, with no measurable impact on the psyche of the volunteer. We do not believe we can assure the same here for a man forced through these processes and will be made to believe this is the future course of the remainder of his life. Had that sentiment ever been expressed to you, that there might be a difference between the impact of these techniques on a SEER volunteer trainee uh, versus a subject who is forced through these processes and will be made to believe that this is the future course of the remainder of his life? I don't know who wrote this. I don't know who put that sentence together. And I hadn't seen it, as I said, until just recently. Uh, no cable gets released without going through the chief of base, so he may have been the one that ultimately wrote it. I didn't have a discussion with him. Or at least I don't remember a discussion about these specific terms. Uh, you know, I wasn't even allowed on the system at that time. So, do you remember that being a concern that anyone raised in in the meeting that's being discussed here? I don't. Um, re I don't remember that being discussed there. 
but I, I remember years and years of uh, working at the survival school uh, trying to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And I also know that the CIA put safeguards in their program, as the SEER schools did, so that it wouldn't. Um, so when it says, um, we will make every effort possible to ensure that the subject is not permanently, physically, or mentally harmed, but we should not say at the outset of this process that there is no risk, would that accurately describe um, the view that you had as well before Abu Zubaydah's interrogation began, that every effort would be made to prevent permanent physical or mental harm, but that it could not be said at the outset that there was no risk? Objection. You're trying to put this man's words in my mouth, and I didn't say this. Uh, what I did say is that we put in, or the CIA put in precautions so that this didn't happen. And in your understanding at the time, uh, keeping in mind those precautions that you've just mentioned, did you believe that there was any risk going forward into Abu Zubaydah's interrogation? No. If I would have believed that we would do that kind of harm to a person, I wouldn't have done it. Did you think there might even be a small risk that that kind of harm could take place? Objection. I don't know my precise thoughts. But I know I deliberated with great soulful torment about this, and obviously I concluded that it could be done safely or I wouldn't have done it. Okay. And in fact, when it reached a point that Dr. Mitchell and I felt that it was no longer useful, not that it was creating permanent harm, but it was no longer useful, we told them we wouldn't do it anymore. And they told us we had to continue. Um, in, the, in the end, we were able to convince them that it wasn't going to be useful and they eventually stopped. Not because we thought we were doing uh, or uh, instilling permanent harm, but because we thought it was no longer useful wasn't done gratuitously. Could you, um, could you just explain a little bit why you experienced torment before you made the decision uh, that you would go forward with the interrogation? Objection. I think any, any normal a uh, conscionable man would have to consider carefully doing something like this. When I was called and asked to do this, I paused, I thought, I wondered. Uh, I took every precaution that I could. Uh, I asked every question that I could. I waited until the weight of the entire nation's judicial system weighed in on it and told us it was legal. I weighed that against the fact that they kept telling me every day a nuclear bomb was going to be exploded in the United States and that because I told them to stop, I'd lost my nerve and it was going to be my fault if I didn't continue. So I thought a great deal about it, sir. And I assume you would have too if you would have been in my place and stood up and gone to defend your nation. And um, when you said um that you were told it was going to be your fault if you didn't continue. Are you referring to um, something that happened prior to the interrogation or during I'm the I'm referring to the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah and us saying that we wanted to stop waterboarding and the CIA telling us that we couldn't because we worked for them and they wanted it continued. And it was your and, um, and Dr. Mitchell's feeling that it was no longer useful at that stage. That's correct. And it was also the opinion of the CIA's later when they did due diligence and came out in person and met with us and stopped it. And you and Dr. Mitchell asked them to come out and, and witness it? Yes, we did. And why did you do that? Because we wanted someone with authority above the chief of base who also wanted it stopped on site who could talk to those men and women who were having to account to the president 
about their efforts to stop this nuclear explosion. Uh, we were we were soldiers doing what we were instructed to do. We knew it was lawful. We knew it was legal. We knew it had been vetted and approved. But we didn't have the power to say stop or go. Uh, but we did push back, and they listened and reasonably stopped. Um, it was an emotional time, Dor. So uh, don't interpret my emotionality as a personal affront. Not at all. But these are serious questions you're asking. Absolutely, and I, I appreciate your candor in answering them. And um, and again, if if um, if it would be helpful to stop at any time, no, please. Fine. Okay. Um, You said uh, that you, you know, before <coughs> using these techniques, you waited a period for them to be approved. Yes. Um, how were those approvals communicated to you? Verbally. Uh, the approvals were sent via cable to the site, and the chief of base called everyone around, said that the approvals had arrived. Uh, we probably saw the portion that specifically gave us our marching orders in terms of what was what we could do and the, f and the right and left limits of what we could do. Uh, that was definitely communicated to us, so I may have seen that part of it, but I didn't see the Department of Justice ruling or opinion or anything like that. I wasn't allowed. Uh, that I hadn't had a polygraph. I had been sent out before uh, all of these uh, things could be done, and so I couldn't get on the system. I see. Um, was that, did you later uh, take a polygraph and get some authorization to be on CIA systems? Yes, I later took many polygraphs and uh, was allowed to get on the system. Is that, um, does the phrase green badge refer to that kind of authorization? Not necessarily, Dora. There are two kind of people who work for the CIA, blue badge people who are actual employees and green badge people who are contract personnel. They all work the same. They all receive the same marching orders. Uh, they're governed by the same chain of command. Uh, we, in our case, uh, work for the director who then went to CTC, who then went to Special Mission Unit, who then went to uh, Renditions and Interrogation Group, then went to the Chief of Station, wherever we were, then to the Chief of Base. Uh, and everything that we did uh, went through that chain. Every interrogation plan went through that chain. Every change of plan or use of technique went through that change and it was all authorized. Uh, um, just, um, just while we're, we're still on this document, um, uh, just towards the, the actually, um, on, on paragraph three, um, it says, the above said, we defer to experts, and as requested, ref below in paras four and five, please find comments drafted by interrogation team members, ICC or psychologists of ref B uh, concerning points raised. Um, is the reference there to ICC or psychologists, to the best of your knowledge, a reference to Dr. Mitchell and to yourself? Objection. You know, I didn't write the cable. Like I said, uh, I don't know who they were referring to. It doesn't have my name in there. In, um, in July of 2002, were there other uh, independent contractor CIA psychologists, to the best of your knowledge, working for CIA? I wouldn't know that, but I don't know of any. And were there you didn't know of any 
Um, I was working in a compartment, uh, and you don't know anything outside of your compartment. And within your compartment, were there other IC seer psychologists? No. Um, at the at the very end of that um, this document, um, it says speaking directly to the issue of inducing severe mental pain. Where are you at? Door? Sorry about that. That's um that's right above paragraph six. I see where you have it highlighted there. Yep. that uh, any physical pressure applied to extremes can cause severe mental pain or suffering. Is that an accurate statement? I have no idea. Do you have a sense of whether um, <coughs> well, uh, okay. What about the sentence, the safety of any technique lies primarily in how it is applied and monitored? Would you agree with that? I would. Um, would you agree that hooding, the use of loud music, sleep deprivation, controlling darkness and light, slapping, walling, or the use of stress positions taken to an extreme can have the same outcome? What outcome? Uh, I believe the outcome is if it, well, let me just ask you, if, if those <coughs> techniques, hooding, the use of loud music, sleep deprivation, controlling darkness and light, slapping, walling, or the use of stress positions are taken to an extreme. Do you believe that they can cause severe mental pain or suffering? I believe if they were taken to extreme, they could be detrimental. What do you mean by detrimental? You don't understand detrimental? I guess to me detrimental. He's allowed to ask you that question, so oh, okay. answer it. <laughs> well, it means uh, not good, harmful in some way. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I, I, I know you know what detrimental means. Um, do, uh, do you think there is a difference between an extreme um, form of a technique being detrimental uh, and an extreme form of a technique inducing severe mental pain or suffering? Objection. Yeah, I think there is a difference. Do you think it's possible that, uh, for example, sleep deprivation taken to the extreme could induce severe mental pain or suffering? Objection. I think that uh, all precautions were taken in the CIA program to preclude that, but in a situation where they weren't there, could. Um, are there any differences between how these um, seer pressures we've been talking about were applied in the SEER schools uh, as opposed to how they were applied in the CIA program? A few. Which ones were those? As applied, as applied, they were the same as they're applied in the SMU training, but their frequency uh, was more in uh, the CIA program. Um, now, Dr. Mitchell has described um, uh, the effect of these techniques to be related to Pavlovian classical conditioning. Do 
you agree that the interrogation strategy with the SEER techniques was based on Pavlovian classical conditioning? Can you show us what were you referring to sure. the document? Sure, sure. Um, so if you, if you look at um, Exhibit 4 from Dr. Mitchell's deposition, so this is, uh, and that's on, um, give us a second here if you like. Sure. And Can we just identify for the record what's before the witness? Sure. So this is um, Exhibit 4 from Dr. Mitchell's deposition, which is a uh, manuscript um, that is called, uh, it was labeled Interrogating the Enemy. And in fairness, this, I think it was identified by Dr. Mitchell as a draft. A not draft the manuscript. Final, the final manuscript. Yes. Uh, and that's at pages 56 to 57 of the manuscript. And I just, um, so anyway, so there Dr. Mitchell writes that uh, he was going to use a psychologically based interrogation program um, and it would need to be based on what is called Pavlovian classical conditioning. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Um, did you have any understanding that the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah would involve Pavlovian classical conditioning? I had an understanding that it would involve stimulus response conditioning, yeah. What does that mean? Same thing, basically. I don't remember him using the term Pavlovian, but it's similar. What, what does stimulus response mean? It means you invoke a certain stimulus uh, to get a certain response. And what did that mean in the context of um, the Abu Zubeda interrogation? Well, the idea was if the detainees didn't respond to social influence techniques and the CIA authorized the use of physical pressures, that using a physical pressure, uh, which could be terminated by cooperation, uh, would constitute a stimulus response. So the the stimulus is the physical pressure, and the response is how Abu Zubaydah would respond? Well, the stim yeah, basically. Um, what, was the, what was the desired response that you were looking to evoke? <clears throat> you want people to talk to you. If you're interrogating someone, you, you just want them to talk at first. So, and then, and then, of course, you want them to talk about things that are useful. Um, and would it be correct to say that at some times the desired response is fear or anxiety? Yes. Um, were you familiar with the concept of learned helplessness in 2002? Yes, I'm familiar with it. <clears throat> um, did you believe that there was a role for learned helplessness in interrogation? Not scientific learned helplessness, where a person's rendered basically incapacitated. <clears throat> in the CIA's program, it was used exactly as described in the Army Field Manual, where you can induce a feeling of helplessness that is then removed, so it's a temporary applied state. Uh, and the idea is that the, the detainee f feels helpless for a time? Is, is the idea that the detainee feels helpless for some set period of time? I don't understand your question. Sure, let me rephrase it. Um, you say it was used exactly as described in the Army Field Manual. Um, so you can induce a feeling of helplessness which is then removed. And it's a temporary applied state. 
I guess let's just take that um, slowly so I can understand it. What do you mean by a temporary applied state? I mean, if you use a physical pressure and the person you're using it on wants you to stop and they know you'll stop if uh, they, you start talking, uh, then you have a choice. Uh, you can start talking or you can get some more of the physical pressure. Uh, the pressure is designed to be used in a way that it doesn't harm, but it makes someone uncomfortable. And they're more irritating than painful, but nonetheless, uh, not something that you want happening. So, if the detainee finds something to talk about, the physical pressure stops, and. If they start to obfuscate and uh, refuse to give useful information again, you can reapply the pressure. Eventually, it doesn't take long to learn that uh, if you don't want that to happen, uh, you can talk or cooperate in some way. Uh, so the discomfort or the helplessness at, the applied state of helplessness that you feel at the time is a, it's a temporary feeling of, oh, you know, how am I going to get out of this? I don't like this. I want this to stop. Uh, as I said, uh, that's the way it's described and recommended for use in the Army Field Manual. But the scientific state of learned helplessness is something that, as you have already pointed out, Jim and I uh, strive hard to prevent in the SEER schools. We also spend a great deal of time uh, talking to CIA officers about this because it was a concept that they, they used the term, but they didn't use the term correctly. Many of them would write uh, cables and reports and say, we're going to use learned helplessness. Uh, they didn't understand the difference between Seligman's classic uh, helpless state, which you don't want because then uh, no one is going to cooperate in that state, as opposed to a temporary feeling of uh, helplessness. So that was one of many emotions or feelings that uh, you tried to manipulate in a detainee to encourage them to be cooperative. Um, okay. Um, do you recall sort of in, in what ways you tried to communicate to the CIA that they were misusing the term learned helplessness? Yes. How, how did you communicate that? If I saw it used inappropriately or heard it used inappropriately, I would explain uh, the difference. Uh, I, I did that many times. Um, and is there, um, I think you mentioned the Army Field Manual. Um, is that sort of the, the origin of the way, let me, let me rephrase that. When you and Dr. Mitchell use the term helplessness in a way that's different, um, as you're saying, from the learned helplessness uh, that was used by Dr. Seligman, um, is the document that describes helplessness in the way that you and Dr. Mitchell use it, is that the Army Field Manual? It's described that way in the Army Field Manual. Um, and are there other sort of research papers or um, psychological manuals or any other literature that you're familiar with that uses learned helplessness in a way that's distinct from Dr. Seligman's learned helplessness? I don't know.
be on a new subject matter here? Um, when we transition, let me know. I just want to take a quick break. Sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're almost there. It's just one more thing on this, and then, then we'll move. Um, so if we can pull um, Exhibit 20 from Dr. Mitchell's deposition, which is uh, tab 18. Tab 18. I'm just going to ask you about the, the very first page there, and then we can take the, a break. The cover page? <laughs> sorry, I think you're, that was a good question. No, it's the, sorry, the second page. Okay. Um, and just about that, uh, that big paragraph uh, in the middle of the page. All right. Can we just identify Exhibit 20 for the record, please? So this is, um, this is labeled as uh, an attachment to a fax um, to Dan Levin at DOJ Command Center. And uh, the document is labeled background paper on CIA's combined use of interrogation techniques. Uh, and, and Dr. Jessen, I wanted to know first whether um, you've ever seen this document before. No. Um, this document uh, includes a sentence that says, the goal of interrogation is to create a state of learned helplessness and dependence conducive to the collection of intelligence in a predictable, reliable, and sustainable manner. Um, would you say that's an accurate statement? No, I wouldn't because learned helplessness is not the only thing that, or helplessness is not the only thing you use in interrogation. This sentence says it is interrogation. That's not. And that's because sometimes you might have other goals besides creating a state of learned helplessness and dependence? Yes. What might those other goals be? Well, you might want someone to desire some kind of creature comfort or uh, there's a, as imaginative as an interrogator can be, there are different ways to approach it. The reason I'm taking issue is because of the way the sentence reads. It says the goal of interrogation and, and I don't agree with that. Yeah. Um, what kind of I think you just mentioned creature comforts, you know, would be a, a different thing that, um, uh, that is, uh, let, let me just, let me just make sure I understand you. Um, would it be correct to rewrite the sentence to say, sometimes the goal of interrogation is to create a state of learned helplessness? Objection. It would be correct to say sometimes a feeling of helplessness, a temporary feeling of helplessness is useful in interrogation. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it would be useful to have a, a subject of interrogation desire a set of creature comforts that the interrogator could provide? Yeah. Um, what kind of creature comforts, for example? I guess just, what does that term mean to you? Uh, candy bar, I was a beta like Pepsi. All right. Um, I think unless, um, look, there's some. Um, I, just, to, just to sort of close this out, um, Sometimes a feeling of helplessness, a temporary feeling of helplessness, um, is helpful in an interrogation. Uh, but could you just elaborate a little bit on how it might be helpful? Just in the way we've just discussed. Uh, um, 
We, we just went over that. Uh, so you mean in the sense that a detainee might be trying to avoid that state and therefore would be incentivized to cooperate? Yeah. Um, okay, I think, uh, I think we can take that break. Time. The time is now 2.20 p.m. We're now off the video record. Whoa, 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 whoa. thank you. I never remember that. We are now back on the record. The time is 2.41 p.m. This begins disc number three. Um, can we get um, tab 20? What exhibit are we up to? Please mark this as Exhibit 29. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for the record, this is a document uh, marked United States Bait 1610 to 1615. Uh, it appears to be uh, some kind of communication subject, eyes only, lessons for the future. Um, and you can just take uh, a bit of time to, to look at it. Um, the questions I'm going to ask you are about um, pages. 
All right. Um, have you ever seen this document before? No. It looks like it was written by an attorney. It does, yeah. It says, uh, sets forth observations by CTC Legal. Um, but it does say it has been coordinated in draft with outgoing, I think, COB as chief of base, incoming uh, various individuals who worked for, um, looks like, UBL, OTS. Um, and it also says I see seer psychologists, which, um, which made me think that maybe you had seen it. Do you remember um, if you maybe saw some draft parts of this document? No, I've never seen it. Um, well, let me, let me just ask you about um, on page 1613, um, the bottom paragraph is labeled contract provisions. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know what M-O-F-A's means? No. Me neither. Um, I've heard the term MOFA in contract or in usage somewhere, but I don't know. Um, <coughs> this appears to discuss um, various provisions that, that will be used for contract personnel, um, such as uh, whether compensation methodology will be hourly or daily, um, additions to compensation that may be comparable to danger pay, hazardous duty pay, or other special allowances, um, and authorities to operate the government's rented vehicles. Do you recall ever having discussions about those types of contract provisions in your contract? No. Um, do you recall ever having discussions about what kind of provision should be included in your contracts with the CIA? No. Okay. Um, do you remember if there was ever an issue around you or Dr. Mitchell being reimbursed for travel, for example? No. Um, okay. Um, and no, no parts of this document uh, seem familiar to you in any way? No. Nope. All right. Um, do you remember at all being involved in some kind of process um, around January 2003 uh, that involved deriving some kinds of lessons from interrogations you had participated in? No. Um, all right. Uh, well, then. Let's move on to, um, to uh, tab 21. Sorry. Uh, what number is it? 30. Um, so this is a document uh, marked as Exhibit 30 that bears Bates stamps uh, US 1915 to 1922 um, and is, uh, appears to be an executive summary. You want me to familiarize myself with it? I, if you could, please. Yes, okay. thank you.
before. Yes. Does this acronym DUCS refer to uh, lawful combatants? So if you if you look at the very first sentence, it seems right. like yeah, it seems to be, you know, you know my what guess and I'm not for? my guess and I'm not the expert is detained unlawful combatants, um, but you know I, I can tell you that that's right. right. I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay. Do you recognize this document? No, I've never seen it. Um, do you see um, on page six of the document, there's uh, something labeled Appendix B Curriculum, and it has as its sources um, you and Dr. Mitchell, and also Tate Incorporated and DOD JPRA. Mm -hmm. Do you remember ever being consulted? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I didn't hear what you said. I, it was it was for me. I, I interrupted you while you were. Um, I had, was not, had not answered yet. I, I wasn't saying anything. All right. Um, do you see how? Do you see how on page six of this, uh, it includes among its sources, both Dr. Mitchell and yourself. I do see that. 
do you recall ever being consulted about uh, the curriculum that is described in this appendix? No. I don't. Um, do you recall ever having discussions about uh, a curriculum that could be used to train interrogators in the CIA? Do you know when this document was written? Is there a date? Uh, there is not, but if you, um, if you turn to page three, um, the, the first complete sentence at the top says, CTC's team is implementing SEER-based individualized psychological pressures to counter Zubeda's resistance with some success to obtain the actionable intelligence from him. Um, based on the timeline of Zubeda's interrogation, do you have an estimate as to when this document might have been produced? Objection. No, I mean, it, you know, if it was concurrent with that, then we all know that it was sometime around August or, and forward in 2002. I've not seen the document. I don't, I don't remember being consulted about it. I was working for the CIA. I guess if they wanted to stick my name on something as a resource, they could because we did what they asked us to do. Uh, as I told you before, we were asked to work with Zubeda, and then we were asked to work with Nashiri, and then we were asked to work with KSM. These programs and acronyms all came as the years rolled on, and they didn't even exist, to my knowledge, when we were working. Uh, there was an individual, and you, you better be ready to stop me if I get in the wrong place here. There was an individual who worked for the CIA, who was a prior SEER instructor, who was involved in all of this, who put together along with an individual who is identified in your documents as the chief interrogator. They put together a, a training course at one time. I wasn't involved in it. I didn't know anything about it happening. Uh, there were, as I said, desperate, I don't mean panicked, I mean different efforts going on that I later became aware of in the agency. As stated in this document, we have all these people, we think they have actionable intelligence, what are we going to do? Uh, when I finally got to the site where I met Gul Raman, was the first time I realized that the agency had other uh, uh, efforts where there were people interrogating and doing these other things. I later found out there were even more than that. Uh, but I didn't know about them, and I didn't participate in them uh, until, well, I didn't participate in them except for the one exception, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, where Guraman was. Later, to put it quickly and bluntly, uh, a lot of this all fell apart and there was a lot of intrigue and problems and people were doing things they shouldn't do. They were breaking the law and stepping outside of the uh, Department of Justice guidelines, not me and not Jim, but there were people doing it. Uh, and this eventually in the Sissy Report all was ascribed to me and Jim, uh, but it wasn't us. But there were things going on. Eventually, this all fell down, including the training course that was eventually put together, because the guy that was in charge of it was training people to do things that weren't even authorized by the Department of Justice. When that all went to hell, and they finally fired that guy, and the other guy was set to the side, they came to Jim and I, and this is, I don't know, 2005, four, I don't know when it was, and they said, well, you guys put together a course to train interrogators. And we said, yes, and, uh, and we did that. But it wasn't until way down the road, way after this. So, but I, I worked for the CIA, and I did, as long as it was legal and authorized, anything they asked me to do. Uh, and I, I don't see it unreasonable that they would say, with good intent initially, because this guy that turned out to be to have done things that he shouldn't have done, uh, was a trusted and, and well-liked uh, member, and he'd done great work for the agency in the past. He just, he just got derailed. 
anyway, if he was putting something together and someone who knew Jim and I said, hey, let's have these guys weigh in on that, put their names down, I'm sure this air instructor that I'm talking about would have done that. I don't think the chief interrogator would because he had great enmity towards Jim and me and there were conflicts that you could trace through the papers if you look carefully uh, all along the line. But uh, I don't know what this is. Uh, it certainly has my name on it, but I don't know what it is. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so would it be correct to say that you first participated in one of these um, interrogation training courses after 2005? In a CIA interrogation course, yes, but, but I, have, I had interrogation courses before that. Okay. Um, but prior to 2005, you weren't involved in a CIA, prior to 2005, you weren't involved in a CIA interrogator training I don't course. know if 2005 is an accurate date. Uh, I do know that they asked us to put together a curriculum, and we did it. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was after this. After but I didn't, uh, and, and uh, because this is part of the question that you just asked me, Dora, at one point in time, again, 15 years ago, and I'm getting older, I don't remember precisely when, uh, CTC came to us and they said, will you please go and audit this course that these people have put together? Tell us what you think. And uh, it was in the United States and we both happened to be there and we went there and we listened for a while until they started teaching things that were unauthorized and we got on the phone and uh, I don't think we stayed there after that. but. If that's what you, I mean, I was there. I wasn't participating as a student, but I was there. Um, and when you say unauthorized, um, are you referring to the, the techniques that were authorized for, for use on Abu Zubaydah? Yes. Uh, I, I never used any techniques that weren't authorized initially by the Justice Department initially for Abu Zubaydah, then for Nishiri, then for KSM, then for a few other people. Uh, that's all I knew that was authorized. And so when I arrived at this other location and they were doing other things, uh, it surprised me. And I asked, are these authorized? Uh, the response I got was, mm, I don't think so. Some of them might be. Uh, so I said, you can't do that, you know. They've got to be authorized. Uh, but I'm working for the CIA. The guy that is doing these things is a CIA officer under whose auspices I now am because they'd sent me there to do a specific job and he asked me to come and talk to Gul Rahman. Uh, so I am walking this line because I don't know what, the, I don't know what's going on, but I know that uh, I'm not in charge. Uh, and we'll get to that, I'm sure. I asserted myself as best I could and did, did what I could do, but uh, if I may say this to you all, you, you may have embarked upon this lawsuit with the best intentions possible, I don't know, but you did it with a document that is so wholly flawed and misinterpreted that you've shot yourselves in the foot, I fear. Because if you even examine the sissy document meticulously, you will see what I'm talking about. And you will also see how they tried to aim it at Jim and my heads because they thought we were demons, because they thought we'd done all these terrible things. We didn't string people up by their arms. We didn't short chain them to walls until they froze to death. We didn't threaten them with drills and guns. We did exactly we, we did due diligence. We said, this is tough work, and we will go and do it for our country, but it has to be legal, and it has to be within the bounds that's acceptable to our nation and our government. And we were told, yes, it is. Here it is. This is what you can do. This is how you can do it. If you decide you want to do anything else, you ask us, which we did every single time meticulously. And so I'm 
realize I'm becoming evangelical, I'm sorry. But that report does not reflect that. That report is distorted. That report is cherry-picked. That report was put together very effectively by people who wanted to attack me and Jim and the CIA independently or collectively. And if you look at the rebuttal report, if you look at the CIA's rebuttal, or I mean the minority report, you will see there is another version to be considered. Uh, so perhaps, even though this is a very distasteful experience for me to be sued by th two individuals I've never met before in my entire life and had absolutely nothing to do with, and one person who I tried to save, and if they would have been in my program, and if they would have done what I recommended be done, he'd still be alive, but Jim, and I are the culpable people. So, again, <laughs> uh, the premise is, is all wrong. Some of the things did happen. They very well did happen. And they were not authorized. But we didn't do them. Thank you for listening. Of course. Um, maybe we should take a short break. Time is 3.17 p.m. We're now off the video record. Stand by. Time is now 3.25 p.m. We're now back on the video record. Um, so did your, um, did your participation in the, um, the Abu Zubaydah interrogation end around August 2002? Did you say August? Yes. Uh, I, in, let me qualify. Um, I don't remember the exact dates, but we interrogated Abu Zubaydah with the uh, techniques for about 17 days. And there were a few days when we weren't using the techniques, when we had told them that we were going to stop. Uh, but subsequent to that, I continued to work with Abu Zubaydah for years. Right. So uh, initially, just using social influence and talking to him. Uh, eventually, when the staff went home, they turned me into a analyst, and I and I would go, I would talk to him, and then I go write the reports up. And then, uh, when they finally got enough people to come in to do debriefings regularly, we would coach the debriefers teach them how to interact with the detainees because at that point in time we wanted to maintain the rapport that we'd established and sometimes when people would come in to debrief they would have a swagger or have an attitude that would uh, be detrimental to uh, them continuing talking so we would coach them we would watch sometimes come in and out of the cell but uh, that went on for years. Uh, so it was mainly a maintenance and in some cases protected detainee from everybody else in terms of you know keeping the environment so that they would uh, continue to talk. So I, I don't know how to answer your question with a specific date. Right. Um, no, I, and that was, that, was, that was very informative. Um, I, I guess um, just so I'm, I'm clear on the timeline. So the, the, the use of the techniques wraps up after a 17-day period in which several of the days there aren't actually um, techniques being used towards the end. Correct. Um, and that, that period is all over in August 2002. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> with, w within, within 20 days of when we started, it was over with. I, I'm pretty sure I could say that. Um, and then... In September and October of 2002, um, were you sort of continuing in that um, debriefing role you were That's describing? Um, and then, um, and then you were called to the site uh, where um, Gul Rahman and Nashiri were. Uh, Nashiri wasn't there when I went there, but he did show up there. I, I see. Um, and you were called to that site uh, sometime around November 2002? I think so. 
And, um, and just to, to let you know, we're going to try to avoid uh, using any exact dates. Any? Exact dates. So, okay. like, I won't That's ask you. That's good for me because I don't remember anything. Oh, good. Anyway. All right. Um, well, I'll never ask you to say, like, you know, November 3rd or something. All right. Um, now, um, we're, we're going to talk about Gul Rahman, obviously. Um, do you recall being interviewed uh, after his death? Yes. Um, and, and were you truthful in your responses at that time? Was I? Were you truthful in your responses at that time? Yes. Um, so I'd, I'd like to um, uh, bring in a, a new exhibit, which is tab 23. Please mark this, this exhibit what? 31. 31. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Um, and so for the record, the, um, the core reporter has shown uh, Dr. Jessen exhibit 31, which is um, labeled Memorandum for the Record. Uh, it is U.S. Bates 1047 to um, 1053. And, uh, and you can take as long as you'd like to, to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, I recognize it, Okay. so I think we can probably proceed. Okay, great. Um, uh, so this is, uh, appears to be an account of, of an interview um, that was done with you in, uh, in January 2003. Do you remember being interviewed around that time? This is what I remember. Um, after I left Cobalt, uh, I went to another location to work and I couldn't get home. I didn't get home until, I don't, uh, it was before Christmas, but whenever it was. Uh, at that time I went directly to the most senior person I knew in CTC and told them about what my concerns were with Cobalt and what with Rockman and so forth. At that time, as I later learned, Rockman was already deceased. Uh, they didn't tell me that, but I did have the occasion to discuss with them what uh, my concerns were. Sometime after that, I was home and I received a phone call and the person identified himself as a CIA officer, and he said, uh, I'd like to talk to you about Gould Rockman. And I said, is he dead? Because uh, I had that concern. And he confirmed that he was. This is where I don't remember exactly. I don't know if this interview was on the phone or, or if I was at Langley, but it would have been shortly after the phone call, if it was, because I, I was deployed again right away. Uh, I didn't ever see this after it was typed up. Uh, I probably would have uh, changed a few things uh, had they allowed me to see it. Uh, but this is uh, an account of the interview. I just don't know if it was in person or on a phone or whatever. Um, do you do you recall what you would have changed? Well, uh, I'd have to go through it line by line, but some of the wording and s some of the syntax doesn't seem like the way I would have said it. Uh, but I, you know, I have no way of, of proving it one way or another because I, ne I didn't ever see it afterwards. I, I see. I'm not asserting that that. Well, I don't know. I just I didn't see it. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, y you know, you said that, um, that you thought he might be dead when, uh, when you got that phone call? That That's Mr. the first thought that came in my mind. And why was that? Because of the deplorable conditions he was in when I left. And could, you, could you describe those conditions? It was cold. Uh, he was in a facility run by a CIA officer chief of base 
but guarded by indigenous personnel who were of a faction uh, incredibly hostile to his faction. And in fact, uh, they surmised that Gul Rockman had been complicit in some way with the death of their leader in not the too distant past. Uh, there was no 24-7 <coughs> surveillance like there was where I had come from. Uh, so for 12 or more hours a day, uh, the detainees were left alone with these indigenous guards. I am not aware of any uh, mistreatment of the indigenous guards with any other detainee except Raman, but they handled him roughly and with disdain. Uh, he was also in the conflict, as I was told by the uh, chief of base. Uh, he would fight with the guards. He threw his dung and urine can, excuse me, at the guards. The guards had given him what uh, were called cold showers. There's a document you have, we all have, that says I observed one of these. I don't know if I did. I know I was told about it. Uh, I was aware of it, but I don't remember specifically seeing it. I was told that it was done because there was no hot water in the facility or they had a pipe problem. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but subsequent to that, I did see Gul Rahman being taken to his cell. He was cold and shivering, and I was concerned that he'd be hypothermic. And so uh, I told the guards that they had to get him blankets and, and insulation. Uh, I talked to the uh, chief of base and said, you know, winter's coming on and, and we need to get heaters in here. And he, and he acknowledged that and said he'd already uh, started whatever the procurement process is to do that. And, and before I left, I did see heaters in the facility. But, but they, uh, they did other things that weren't authorized. Uh, they did what they called a hard takedown, which they asked me to observe, and I did. Uh, and uh, they didn't do it in a completely out of control way, but it wasn't approved and it didn't seem to have any usefulness that it perhaps could have had. If you, it, it's, a, it's a technique that could definitely dislocate your expectations about what's going on, but they returned him immediately to his cell and then just left him there. So if you're going to dislocate someone's expectations, then you want to go in there with your interrogation skills, social influence skills, and see if you can leverage that in some way. Uh, I made that suggestion to the officer. Uh, so that and other things were going on uh, when I got there. Um, and I think, um, I think uh, you described the um, the cold shower uh, that either either you saw or, or became right. aware of uh, yeah. th through description. Um, in this interview, um, you described it as a deprivation technique. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you meant by that? Yeah, I do. Uh, in seer jargon, uh, deprivation technique is anything that disrupts the steady state, as I said earlier. So uh, if I was to take away your Coca-Cola and you really wanted it, it would be a deprivation. If I were to take away all your clothes, that would also be a deprivation. So there are various degrees. But uh, I asked the site manager if, if he had approval for that kind of deprivation. I don't remember specifically what he said. I'm not trying to, you know, aim this at him. Uh, it's self-evident what he did if you read the documents. Uh, but it, but it, uh, it was a deprivation, not one that I w would have used, not one that I was sanctioned 
used, not one that the Department of Justice, to my knowledge, had approved, but it was a deprivation. Um, and by this point in, in November 2002, um, was there, you know, a set of techniques uh, that you understood to have been approved by the Department of Justice? <coughs> well, uh, the techniques that we were uh, given to use with Abu Zubaydah were the only ones I knew of. <coughs> Certainly the only ones I was authorized to use. In fact, at that time, only Dr. Mitchell and myself were authorized to use those things. And then, <clears throat> were those techniques um, referred to at that time, if you know, as, uh, as enhanced interrogation techniques? I don't remember. You know, those terms evolved over time. Uh, the term HVD. You know, that didn't exist when we started. The term MVD, uh, the first I rem I think cobalt may have been the first I heard that term uh, because there were another group of people there working with the chief of base doing interrogations, doing this stuff that we're talking about. And uh, in fact, they did use that term because the individual they had sent me there to, to uh, talk to not Gul Rahman, but another person. They, when I got there, they identified him as an MVD. So there was some some distinction made between him as an MVD and someone else as an HVD. Eventually, in the program, it was a very clear distinction, uh, and I don't know when that evolution solidified, but eventually, uh, HVDs were only the highest value people like KSM and Zubeda and Nashiri and Gul Rahman and, and uh, uh, getting old and I can't roll them off my uh, tongue uh, quickly, but there were, there were a group that were so designated. Uh, and with the exception of when I was at Cobalt for, I was there for maybe two or three weeks, I don't remember. Uh, that's the only time I saw or worked with any H HVDs as they came to be known, or I mean uh, MVDs as they came to be known. Um, but, but eventually those distinctions were used all the time. And um, do you happen to know whether um, both after uh, Mr. Rahman's death and, um, and after you raised the, the concerns you raised about uh, the facilities at Cobalt, uh, whether changes were made at Cobalt? As I told you before I left Cobalt, I saw heaters. Uh, the chief of base, at that time, uh, I had a pretty amicable relationship with him. I later found out from uh, Mr. Durham and other documents that when Gul Rahman Bachman died, he panicked and lied and tried to say that it was my fault. So I don't have the same feelings I had about him at the time, but at the time he seemed switched on, motivated, cooperative. Uh, he, I told him that there were a multitude of things about cobalt that were wrong and needed to be fixed, and he was very open and in fact asked me to help him, and he and I compiled a list on Lotus Notes, not in a cable, that's their version of email, the CIA's version of email, and he was receptive to that. I never saw him personally abuse, uh, it with the exception of doing the techniques that weren't authorized, I never saw him act in an abusive way. Uh, and he, like I said, he seemed receptive to the suggestions I had. He, he also told me that, and this is when I, uh, the last document we looked at that talked about all this training, when I was there, he told me that uh, there were new interrogators being trained. I, you know, first I'd heard of it, and uh, I assumed that they would be trained and then uh, be required to follow the same guidelines that Jim and I were following. And my, so my comment to him was, well, I would wait until the trained interrogators got out here to continue what you're doing. Uh, this was just before I left because, uh, as you know, uh, headquarters asked me to do an assessment on Ghoul Rockman to determine whether what they, uh, I think in the cable they did use the acronym EIT, 
uh, I didn't see the cable, but I think that's what uh, the, the, the chief of base said. Uh, but I, because I knew that they were talking about the technique specifically used where I was working. And I did that assessment and I determined that, you know, they wouldn't be useful on him. He, he was uh, incredibly strong, uh, centered, focused, uh, excellent resistor. He took the abuse from those indigenous guards with a with an air that was very surprising. You know, you'd say, are you okay? And he'd say, I'm just fine. He'd say, uh, well, I said to him, you know, is there anything I can get for you? Would you like uh, food? Would, you know, do you need anything? And he'd say, no, I, you know, I'm just fine. I'd show him his, his own driver's license with his photograph on it and say, uh, this is your picture and, and it says your name is Gould Rockman. Is that your name? He'd say, I don't understand how that how that happened, and he would smile. Uh, he was an incredible resistor. So using physical pressures on a man like that, all you do is uh, either irritate them or push them farther away from where you want to be. So I recommend they not use them. But they were convinced that he had high-level information. There's a, there was a unit at the station, uh, which will go unnamed, that was specifically tasked with identifying from all these people that were transiting through this location. There were a lot of, a lot of people went through there. Uh, and they were tasked with kind of sorting out uh, who might be useful, who, ha who might have important information, who might not. And, and they told me they, that they thought uh, Gould Rockman was top of their list. Uh, Now I don't know where I'm at. Um, well, uh, this, this was very helpful. Um, so I, I just want to make hope sure. for me. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, I just want to make sure I, I understand sort of the way, um, and, and feel free not to answer if this trespasses into, into classified information. I, I'm just trying to understand how the recommendations y you make or assessments you make find their way into cables. Cause it, it's I, I can tell you that. Sure, but I'll, I'll ask in the form of right. question even to make it easier for you. I'm going to get kicked by my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't kick you with my feet. So is it correct to say that the chief of base is the one who ends up writing the cables? Yes. And you have some kind of interaction with the chief of base? I did. I worked with him. He asked me to help him assess Ghoul Rockman in terms of how he could in interrogate him and, and uh, get this, whatever the information is they thought he had. And so you would, you would convey, you know, whatever information you were asked for, and the chief of base would write it up That's in these correct. cables? Um, all right, so um, I'd like to, to look at a couple of those cables. Um, I think the, the first one is at, is at tab 24. This is 32? 31. 32. So the exhibit 32 has been marked, which is um, United States Base 1072 to 1074, which is a cable labeled eyes only, non-compliance of Gul Rahman.
Okay. Um, do you recognize this document? You know, I don't know if I've seen this one before. Uh, it the c the content seems you know familiar, but I don't I don't know if I've seen this particular one. Um, do you remember um, <coughs> advising uh, on the creation of a cable um, regarding the the first forty eight hours of interrogation of Gul Rahman? No. I don't. Um, do you remember uh, assessing whether he um, had a sophisticated level of resistance training? Yes, I do. Uh, and do you remember identifying examples of his, um, or let me rephrase that, did you notice things that suggested to you that he had a sophisticated level of resistance training? Yes. Are some of those... Uh, I assumed he did. And, and were the reasons for, for your conclusion uh, or, or your assumption that he had a sophisticated level of resistance training, were some of those laid out in this cable? Yes. Uh, these bullet points, uh, at least several of them, seem consistent with my observation. And I could have, in fact, made those observations to the chief of base who then incorporated them in his cable. When I got there and he asked me to help him, I went and observed him uh, interrogating Gul Rockman twice. Then uh, he said, uh, the agency wants you to make an assessment. So uh, I did, I believe I did four sessions. Each one would have been probably an hour or less. Uh, so that was the sum total of time I spent with Gould Rockman, except the couple of times I observed him uh, out of the interrogation room. But the, the, the chief of base, to my recollection, continued to question and interrogate him all the time that I was there. Um, and, and when you were um, pointing earlier at these, uh, these bullet points in the cable, are you, are you referring to um, the paragraph that... Uh, paragraph or the, the, four, the bullet point, no, paragraph four, the bullet point, the last page of the... And those are the, the bullet points labeled A through J in paragraph four? Yes. Uh, I don't know that I made all those observations, but it seems reasonable to me that I did some of them because of the, the judgment that I made about his resistance posture. Um, and those included uh, your judgment that he was ignoring obvious facts, like the driver's license that had Correct. his picture on it, um, that he was unresponsive to provocation? Uh, I don't know if I said that or not. I could have said that. I don't know when this was written. As part of my assessment, I used a facial slap uh, to, de to determine how he would respond, as I was authorized to do. And uh, as I suspected, he was impervious to it. Uh, he, uh, it, I could tell that you know it would be futile and gratuitous to, to do those things. So. Uh, that possibly could have led to that bullet, but I don't know. Because I don't remember the sequence and the time. What about the, um, the claimed inability to think due to conditions cold? Uh, which one is that? Which letter? That's uh, C. Claimed inability to think due to conditions. I, I don't know what the hyphenated cold means. Uh, I didn't give him cold showers. I didn't strip him naked and hold him and hang him up in his cell naked. I didn't do those things. I didn't shortchain him to the wall with no clothes. I did only what the government had authorized me to do. Uh, but it was cold there, and he didn't act like it was. So that's the best answer I can give you, Dor. Um. All right. Well, let's um, let's move to the next one, which is complained about poor treatment. Do you do you recall him doing that? Not to me, no. 
he was always everything was fine when I talked to him. Um, and is that also you don't recall him complaining about the violation of his human rights? I don't. Would those um, would those behaviors uh, suggest resistance training to you? They would be consistent with with resistance training. Yes. What about um, claiming inability to think due to Definitely. a cold condition? How would you tell the difference between someone who was actually having trouble thinking because they were cold uh, to someone who was just claiming it as a resistance technique? That's a good question. If you thought that was happening, you would call in a physician or someone to examine them and make sure that uh, they weren't suffering in that way. Um, do you know whether anyone called in a physician for Mr. Rockman? I know people ask for physicians because I asked for them and Jim asked for them multiple times. We asked for an audience with the chief of station and weren't given it. We talked directly to the PA that was in charge of medical care out there and told him he needed to go see Gul Raman and he told us that he didn't work on fucking terrorists. Pardon my French, but that's a quote. Uh, we tried. Uh, and I continued trying when I got home. Um, and when you said you um, you used um, an authorized insult slap um, to check his response to provocation. Yes. Um, how did you come to know that that was something that was authorized for you, son? Uh, on Gul Rahman? I'm, I was authorized to use these techniques. I was asked by the CIA to assess him for their use. The only reasonable way to determine that would be to pick the least intrusive one, see how he responded, in addition to other t tales in terms, of, in terms of things I've already told you about his staunchness and resilience. Um, so the way it would work was you'd try out a, a the least intrusive of the sort of physical authorized techniques, and then you would request permission if you thought, um, you know, let me, let, me, let me restart that, sorry, that was too complicated. <laughs> um, so the way in which the process would work, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, and please tell me if I'm not, is that you would make an assessment based on your exploratory use of the least intrusive technique you were authorized to use. I don't agree with what you're saying. Sure, I, I'm sure I got that wrong. Uh, I was authorized to use specific techniques. I was sent to Cobalt for another reason, but while I was there, the CIA sent a cable to the chief of station, to the chief of base, and said, have him tell us whether we should use these techniques on him or not. And, and so I interviewed him, I questioned him, I used the least intrusive of those techniques, I made my determination and recommended they not be used. Um, okay, that's, that's a much better description than the one I, I asked about. Um, let me see. Um, so I think um, I think we uh, we also discussed um, you witnessed something called a hard takedown. I did. Could you describe what that was? You want to read it? Uh, sure. Or I mean, you want me to describe it? I'd I'd prefer if you described it. Okay. It's been fifteen years, so. Uh, would you like to look at the, the document directly? No, to I can describe it. Uh, the chief of base and three or four GRS guys uh, went precipitously into Rockman's cell, picked him up, hustled him outside, and then uh, they hollered and yelled and threw what appeared to me to be pulled punches occasionally at him as they ran up and down the corridor in the uh, detention facility. 
they then returned him to his cell and locked him in there. Um, and, and you said that that was sort of a waste of a technique because they didn't talk to him afterwards? What I said was, first of all, it wasn't authorized. Secondly, if they were authorized to do something like that, which I would not choose to do, uh, to dislocate exploit expectations, uh, they forgot the most important part, and that was to stay with the individual and see if they could leverage that in some way to get him to talk. Uh, I don't believe they did it out of cruelty. I believe they were ignorant to the second piece that needed to be done. And I, I explained that to the chief of base. And I said, if you are going to do this, if, if you get this authorized, uh, this is what I recommend to you. And again, he was receptive to that. Um, do you recall whether um, during the time you were spending with him, um, with Mr. Ro Rockman? Yeah. Do you recall whether he was clothed most of the time? No, he wasn't clothed all the time. I had to have him, I asked them to put clothes on him on two different occasions because he was cold and asked blankets to be taken to him. W was he mostly wearing a diaper? No, not when I saw him. He had uh, a dish dash, uh, which is that uh, ubiquitous uh, one piece long garment that you see in Afghanistan, or, and you see at different places, wherever he was. His, his nationality is known. Um, so uh, he was wearing this garment um, most of the time? Yeah, when I interrogated him, he was, yeah. And do you know whether he was being kept naked some of the time as well? I think he was. In fact, I, I know he was because I saw him that way and told him to get clothes on him. So is it that he'd be naked between interrogations, but he'd be garbed in this dish dash during the interrogations? I don't know. I, uh, I told you the interaction I had with him. I didn't see him every day. Uh, I don't know. Um, There's um, there's one uh, one thing you th that's written down in the uh, in the interview summary that I wanted to ask you about. So that I think is is that Exhibit Thirty One. Interview summary. Uh, you mean the when the individual interviewed me about the circumstances of his death? That's right. I don't know which one. I think I have it right here. Um, so, on uh, just on the bottom of um, of page 1050, and then at the top of, of page 1051, there's a there's a, a paragraph I'd like to ask you about. Um, so it says that you stated that if a detainee is strong and resilient, you have to establish control in some way or you're not going to get anywhere. Does that sound accurate? It sounds like something I might have said, but I never saw this document after I gave you interview. Um, do you think that's an accurate description of, um, I guess, but let me rephrase that. Sitting here today, uh, would you agree that if a detainee is strong and resilient, you have to establish control in some way or you're not going to get anywhere? This is what I'd agree to. If 
the detainee was designated by the CIA as someone that I was supposed to interrogate and I had permission to use the authorized Department of Justice techniques on him and he was not forthcoming, then I would say that's an accurate statement. Um, and, and it looks like the next sentence says, if bound by the Geneva Convention, this person would not break. Um, is it your impression that um, if you were bound by the Geneva Convention, um, you would not be able to break a detainee? I'm not sure I understand your question. It, it was not a well-asked question. Um, maybe you could just explain to me the sentence, if bound by the Geneva Convention, this person would not break. Okay, first of all, 15 years ago, I'm not sure exactly what I said. Uh, so all I can do is speculate about what this guy, uh, and maybe I'm not supposed to speculate. I mean, well, certainly let me not. help you out here. That is exactly what you're not supposed yeah. to do. So I, you know, so I don't, I don't you know. Can, you don't, don't know, know what he meant by what he said? State that for the I record. I don't know what, what he meant. Um, do you have any understanding today of whether detainees can be effectively interrogated within the confines of the Geneva Convention? Objection. Do I have it? L let me ask it another way, <laughs> sure. Um, you know, we spoke a little bit about the Army Field Manual yes. earlier. Yes, yeah. Um, are you familiar with the techniques that are authorized in the Army Field Generally, Manual? Generally, yeah. I don't have it memorized, but I know what's in there. Do you, um, do you believe today that the Army Field Manual uh, provides sufficient um, latitude for an interrogator who's looking to interrogate someone who has information? If that interrogator has the right kind of person. Uh, if you look into the history of the Army Field Manual and its purpose, you'll see that it was designed even from its inception, it's had iteration changes. It was designed to question and interrogate a field troop, one out of a thousand people captured, uh, to narrow the field, to get to the people who had uh, the most information. Uh, and in that sense, it has been, and I'm sure remains effective on many people. Uh, the people that I was asked to interrogate, like Zubeda and KSM and others, uh, it would not have been effective at all. Uh, um, and do you know if, um, if the techniques in the Army Field Manual uh, were tried on, on those individuals? I don't know. Um, I don't know where that comment came from. I don't know where that comment about the Geneva Conventions came from. Just for the record, for what individuals are we talking about? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm at Zubayd and KSM, who you just mentioned, as people who the Army Field Manual techniques would not be effective. I do not believe they'd be effective on those two individuals I mentioned. And do you know whether they were tried on those two individuals? No, I wasn't with them all the time. Um, <coughs> it um, on on the same page, um, and and again, you know, let me know if um, if these if these words don't make sense to you or, or seem inaccurate. You're on. Uh but, um, but, but on the very, uh, the very bottom of the page we were on, which is 1051. Bottom of 1051, okay. Um, it says, people can go hundreds of hours with sleep deprivation and not have ill effects. Um, do you believe that to be true? I, you know, I'm not up on the literature right now. I know you can go a long, long time without a new bounce back, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, do you know 
how Ghul Rahman was deprived of sleep? No, I don't. You mean how they orchestrated it so he couldn't sleep? I don't know the answer to that. Did you have uh, a sense of how sleep deprivation was accomplished uh, with detainees? I know how sleep deprivation was accomplished on some detainees. Did you know how it was accomplished on detainees at Cobalt? I do not. Do you know how it was accomplished uh, with Nashiri? I don't remember sleep deprivation being used with Nashiri, but I was only with him for a few days. Um, why, why, don't, why don't we ask this in a, in a different way? What methods have you seen um, for inducing sleep deprivation? I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you. Is that? We can take a moment. Should we well, take we a minute? Defer on that one just in case sure. The time is 4.10 p.m. We're now off the video record. Time is now 5.25 p.m. We're now back on the record. Madam Court Reporter, can I ask you to repeat the question before we confer with the governor? It's pending. Maybe, um, Mr. Schilke asked if you would be kind enough to repeat the last two questions. And I suspect there was an answer in there, too, to the second to the last question. Do you know if anyone else in the CIA was making alterations to those techniques? Answer, I know that that did happen, yes, question. And how did those, how did you become aware of those alterations? Answer, I don't know if I can tell you. And then we took the right. Okay. Okay, we good? Did you become aware that someone else in the CIA made alterations to the EITs? Yes. And how did this, you become aware of that? Okay. Let's so see if I get through this accurately. It's confusing because I was, I was working. I was sent out to do this guy, then do this guy, and then do this guy with this specific roadmap, with these specific rules. They never changed. Uh, but as that transpired, I find out, I found out contemporaneously back then years ago and then found out even more going through these documents that you have, uh, there were people over here working for the CIA, interrogating people, came up with their own rules of the road. I don't know how they did it. I don't know who approved them. Uh, some of them I heard about. Some of them I discounted because I, I thought, geez, that, you know, may not be true, I don't, I don't know. Another group over here, I go to uh, Cobalt, I find out there's a whole operation going on here, they've got 30, 40 people. Uh, later I find out they're, they've run a training program and they're, and they're sending interrogators out to, to do things. I know nothing about it. I'm in this line and, and it's understandable, I guess, because they're all, they're all compartments, although I think they were all under CTC. But they're compartments, so I don't know what they're doing. I don't know who they're doing it to. I did find out later that some of those people came into uh, the facilities where I had worked and interacted with people that I worked with, not when I was there. I don't know what they did to them. I don't know how long they did it. Uh, I found out subsequently that uh, there was a whole other facility uh, somewhere that were processing a whole bunch of what they at that time called MVD people. Uh, I didn't know anything about their program, what the rules were. I didn't help them develop it. I didn't give them suggestions. Uh, but I did eventually find out who it was and uh, 
So it was very confusing. But to try and synthesize it down to what I know, because what I know is what I was authorized to do and the people that I saw. Nothing changed in the program I was in substantively. There may have been something that the, that the physicians wanted to tweak or something like that that I don't know about. Uh, so I'm doing CYA due diligence. There may have been little things, but in terms of what we were told to do and authorized to do, that didn't change. I only know specifically of one technique that was authorized, not authorized for me to use or, or where, where I was at, but somewhere else for someone else, and that was called water dousing. And that had uh, gone through the channels and had, receiving, had received approval to be used. I, I didn't use it. I never saw it used. But I did know, I don't know when for sure I heard that, but I'm, uh, but I'm confident that I saw, either was told or saw in a document somewhere that that was an authorized technique to use on these MVDs. Which group of NVDs, which effort, uh, I don't know. Oh, I'm, I'm, I know it might be tedious for you, but what I'm trying to communicate to you is there were all kinds of efforts going on. We were at war. We were in a running gun battle with these people. And everybody was trying to do something. I don't know if it was good or bad. I know some of it wasn't good. And I've told you about that. And the CIA had been really upfront and acknowledged all that. And they took the appropriate actions and, and sanctioned the people uh, who engaged in those behaviors. Although, if you read the Sissy report, you'd think that was me and Jim, which it wasn't. So that one, <laughs> that one I do feel confident about. But Lord knows what else was going on. There was a lot. And. Um did you ever have to sign some documents acknowledging, you know, the scope of what was or was not permitted within the program? Eventually, and I don't know when this happened either, uh, when you would go to a location to work, uh, there, would, there was a protocol. It had all the approvals. It had all of the uh, authorizations. It had a current plan for whomever it was you were going to work on, if one had been written, if not, you had to write one. So I did see those things. That wasn't standard to start with because people were just grabbing their kit and running. But it did become a protocol. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but I did see those. Um, it's just to, um, to return to a moment to um, that time uh, where it seemed like at least some of the ITs were going to be phased out. Yes. Um, and you and Dr. Mitchell did not make the decision as to which EITs would or would not continue. Um, you said that both, well, you said that you certainly found uh, walling useful. Yes. Um, and I believe you said that's because it dislocates expectations. I, I used walling for I don't know, 17 or 18 years in training. I knew how it's discombobberating. It, uh, it doesn't hurt you, but it, it jostles the inner ear. It makes a really loud noise. It's safe because of the wall that you construct to do it on. And yet it sounds like, uh, it sounds pretty tremendous. Uh, and if someone is going to be dislocated uh, in the terms that we've been talking about, that usually does it. Uh, so I did think it was effective, one of the most effective. I, we didn't have a rating scale, but yes, I thought walling was effective. Um, it was about effective on me. Uh, I went through several schools with our allies you know, some schools where they could do use physical pressure, some schools where, uh, for example, the UK at that time, they couldn't use any physical pressures, but they would stand you in a tunnel 
on one of the moors with the rain coming through until you thought you were going to freeze to death and uh, and uh, you know uh, so I I'm not new to this uh, and I know what's safe and I know what works and walling is safe and it works and does cramped confinement work they still use it, and I and it, I think it is useful. Yeah. What about dietary manipulation? I'm not sure what you mean by that. That had different meanings in time. Did you have a sense of what it meant in the CIA EIT context? I can tell you this: uh, when Abu Zubaydah was waterboarded, the physicians had determined that he uh, had had enough time since he had his rice and beans, that uh, he wouldn't throw up. Uh, but he, he still had some food in his stomach. And uh, although the physicians told us he wasn't in any danger, it was disturbing uh, to see him throw up. And, uh, and they didn't want that to happen anymore. So they said, let's use Ensure. Uh, and that I believe came to be identified as dietary manipulation. That's my understanding. So you're I, I don't know of other dietary manipulation. We, we fed these, once they got out of the hard times, which was usually a week or two, they were fed halal meals and fed to the extent possible anything that they wanted to eat. So I don't know what other meaning, but as I said to you, there were many other efforts, and they may have come up with that term and used it in a way I don't know about. Um, and when you say once they got out of the hard times, you mean the period where the EITs were, were applied? Physical pressures. Um, okay, let's um, let's turn to. Um, Exhibit 21, which I think, um, I think we've discussed a little bit, which is the CIA's uh, response to the, the Senate report. Well, I'm not going to read this whole thing right now. And, uh, I, and I haven't read the whole thing before now, so you should direct me where you want. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question about um, page 25. Um. So it says there, uh, we agree that the CIA should have done more from the beginning of the program to ensure that there was no conflict of interest. Where are you at? I'm sorry, I'm at the, the second paragraph on page 25. Second bullet. Second bullet on page 25. You are? Page 25. That bullet right there. Where is we agree? Well, he's. I, I'm sorry, I started in the middle of the sentence. Okay, all right, I'm with you now. Um, so just take a, take a look at that sentence. Okay. Um, do you agree that you and Dr. Mitchell designed and executed the techniques? No. What's your, what's your disagreement with that? I didn't design anything. Um, did you and Dr. Mitchell propose the set of techniques to the CIA that was used in the EIT program? I didn't propose them to the CIA. When I got to the CIA on that day in, was it June <laughs> or July? <laughs> in June, uh, the show was already running and I helped compile the list of things we had done for years and years and years, and it was a transfer of techniques and knowledge from one place to another place. Nothing was created. 
Um, and uh, do you agree that you played a role in evaluating the effectiveness of the techniques? No. Um, so the CIA was incorrect uh, I have in no writing idea the what sentence? they meant with what they said right there. I never wrote anything. I never made a, a uh, verbal presentation to anyone. Uh, I may have said they, they're talking, and when you're an interrogator, what you want people to do is talk. But if you will look, uh, it's not an indictment of you, but if people will look at what the CIA said about the information they got, or what the, uh, the opposition rebuttal said, or what the analysts on the ground said, it's a very different opinion than the opinion that's rendered in the sissy. Nonetheless, I had nothing to do with any of those opinions. Um, did you ever assess uh, the interrogation records of people you did not personally interrogate? So what I'm asking is, you interrogated a number of detainees. Yes. There were a whole much larger number of people that the CIA detained and interrogated that yes. you did not personally interrogate. Correct. Did you ever review any records of those interrogations that you did not personally participate in? I have no recollection of doing that. I, uh, well, I, in, I did, I interrogated Gul Rahman, so I had looked at what they said about him, but no one else. Um, so the CIA never asked you uh, to try to make some kind of analysis of the interrogations that had been done by people besides yourself and no, Dr. Mitchell? we didn't do anything like that. Um, Uh, so, just staying on this exhibit, if you, if you look at, at 49. Page 49? Page 49. Uh, and just at the very, the bullet at the very top. Okay, where are you on page 49? Um, that, that very top bullet. Top bullet. Okay. Um, so, would you again disagree that uh, the agency permitted the contractors to assess the effectiveness of enhanced techniques? Absolutely. I never did that. You can search till the cows go home and you're never going to find anything like that. We didn't do it. Um, and, and so it's, to the best of your knowledge, Dr. Mitchell was never involved in assessing the techniques? To the best of either. my knowledge, no. And did um, Mitchell, Jess, and Associates have any kind of contract? Uh, to assess the effectiveness of the enhanced techniques? Not in the context that you're talking about here, no. What, what other context? I don't know. I'm just trying to be exclusive. Um, are you aware of any context in which Mitchell Jess and Associates was contracted to assess the effectiveness of enhanced techniques? No. I'm convinced there was none. Okay. <coughs> Um, do you know whether Dr. Mitchell ever had a goal of finding and paying an independent researcher not involved in the program to assess whether it was effective? No, I don't know anything about that. Um, do you, um, prior to this lawsuit being filed, did you communicate fairly closely with Dr. Mitchell? We're, we've been friends for a long, long time. Uh, so I'm sure I communicate with him often. But when we were treated the way we were and lost our jobs, our livelihood, and our reputations, uh, we didn't spend our time sitting around talking about this damn program, I'll tell you that. Um, and that's you're talking about after 2007, when it was? Uh, 2009. 2009? Yep. Um, 
How would you like to be sitting in, uh, I'm not going to say that, but you're a good guy and you don't deserve the abuse. Never mind, sorry. No, and, and, and thanks for, for sitting here and answering my questions. Well, I don't know that you are, but you seem to be. Um, you better move on. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you read Dr. Mitchell's book? Yes. Um, would you say it's generally accurate? I'd say it's generally accurate. Um, do you ever consider going out in public and talking about your role in the program? I have considered that. It would be a very special and discreet instance, but I, I have volunteered to go to the 9-11 families and talk. Uh, but it's not my nature to be in a public light, so, but I, I haven't ruled it out. I have a family, I have grandchildren. Two Christmases ago, I'll tell you a story. Two Christmases ago, I get a call from the CIA. My grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law are living with us. You have 15 minutes to get out of your house because, I'll, uh, because uh, ISIS has found someone to come to kill you and your family. Now, those, that isn't the only threat I've received over the years. I've received lots of them. And I'm not afraid. And I did my duty, and I stood up, and I went to war. And I'll stand up to any of them again. But I don't want to mess it with my family. And when you stick your face in the public eye, you get people like the sissy and Senator Feinstein and the ACLU and other people who accuse you of things you didn't do, who out your name, who give them your address, who print articles that are full of crap about you, and it makes it difficult. So why would I want to complicate my life more by going out in public when the public's already made up their mind about things? I want to protect my family. So my answer is no. I'm very circumscribed about it, but I would go and talk to the 9-11 family. Um. Just, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, do you remember in the context of this lawsuit when you were um, asked by your attorneys to conduct a, a search for documents in response to a request? Um, did you conduct that search yourself? Yes. Did you um, search any email accounts? I searched everything you asked for. I turned over to my attorney everything I had that you asked for. I did it promptly and completely. Did you, um, I, I know um, I, I'm, I'm speaking only about the, uh, the period before this lawsuit was filed. Did you have any kind of policy for retaining your email or other correspondence? I don't ever keep my email more than a year. And the emails that you would be interested in were never written on my computer. They were written on CIA <laughs> computers that Mr. Durham tried to open up and the CIA couldn't even open them up. So they're probably lost in perpetuity. But uh, I didn't have, I, Dora, I didn't have emails about work on my computer. I didn't have cryptic notes about research and the APA and this scheme that they uh, claim people were involved in. I had none of that. Uh, I wanted as far away from that as I could get. I'd had enough of it. But I turned in everything I had. You have it. I've got Thank nothing you. more for you. Um, I, I think we are, we are almost done. I'm just going to quickly um, take a break. Um, but I think we're basically there. Taking a break? Yes, a very quick one, I hope. Okay. Time is 5.48 p.m. We're now off the video record. We are now back at the record. The time is 5.50 p.m. Uh, so you've said several times today that the um, SISI report is, the, the majority report, is wrong uh, and inaccurate. Um, and I just wanted to ask you what they got wrong. Objection. 
We don't have time. Didn't just, really just, want just briefly, just, just, uh, just like some bullet points as to, as to. That's an inane question. So, so here, are you asking for just some examples? Yeah, I just like to know because the, the, you know, Dr. Jessen has testified numerous times today that the report is inaccurate. I just wanted to know what his objections to it were. And again, I'm, I've been quiet all day, so we're talking about the executive summary, which yes. is some 500 pages. You want us to go through every page and tell you where we think it's wrong? Uh, no, I don't. Um, okay. I was hopeful so that I was hopeful that there could be a summary of what was wrong with it. But if that's if that's impossible to provide, uh, then I well, certainly let's hear from the witness. I think it would be impossible without a lot of time and patience and the document to point out all of the inconsistencies and distortions and outright falsehoods, the cherry picking, the intentional direction to defame and slime and make vulnerable to hostile sources, Dr. Mitchell and myself, uh, like I said, there's not time. Okay. Anything further? I, I think we're done. Okay. Thank you. We have no questions. The time is 5.52 p.m. We are now off the video record. This ends disc number four and today's deposition.